I thought I could make my own bike. I, I wanted to give it a try, and I, I didn't have any roadblocks along the way. Like, nothing big popped out and was a reason that I couldn't do it. So I just kept trucking. The feeling of hopping on that bike for the first time and it performing the way that you expected it to is just so cool. I was blown away. I was like, I could race this thing right now. It's better than the bike I raced all year. I was like, I would watch DVDs, Clay Porter, Earth movies. Yeah, dude. Like, I would just watch them, like, on repeat every day after school, and you'd see Sam Hill, and then to get to go watch him race the US Open, the coolest thing ever. Why could a guy who's never made a bike before make a bike that felt better than people that have spent a very long time making bikes? I think I just knew what I wanted. Probably some other World Cup guys that I shouldn't say. They're like, "Yo, can I hop on that thing? Let's <laughs> yeah. let's let's switch bikes." I met a gypsy. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to do the whole thing, and then I've done literally hundreds and hundreds of these, and their first one with a new setup, I'm like, "Is everything? Are we good here?" Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, Nika, welcome to the show, mate. I, uh, I've been a, a bit of a fanboy of the project that, that you and your brother have been cooking up and it's really cool to see it. It's basically coming to fruition. You just announced a new team um, that will be taking on a bunch of races all over the world. So it's been really cool to uh, watch the project. Yeah, thanks, man. And uh, thanks for having me in here. I listen to a lot of your interviews and I'm stoked to be on. So you're in town right around Supercross time. Not a coincidence, I'm assuming. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I always love to get to go watch the races if I can. Uh, invited out here this week by Jordy from Fox to do a little bit of suspension testing. And uh, yeah, it worked out that we can go watch the race tomorrow. So I'm super excited. Yeah, that's sweet. So you got Fox as a clothing sponsor as well. Obviously, like they're super deep in the, in the moto world. So is there like synergies that kind of like cross over with those guys here? Yeah, I mean, they got me the tickets for the race and Austin said that he'll take me on a tour of all the, the pits tomorrow. So, um, yeah, I'm always a fan of the, the Fox guys and I've gotten to meet a lot of the riders that ride for Fox as well. So, yeah, a lot of synergy. It's cool to have a brand like that that is involved heavily in, in both sports. Do you, Have you been to Supercrosses before? Yeah, I've been to the Atlanta round a yeah. few times and then obviously being out here in California, I've been to Anaheim or I think I was even at San Diego once before in the old stadium. So I've probably been to you know, five or 10 races. Yeah, sick. Did you ride moto back in the day or like what's your moto history as a rider? As a kid, I did. My dad bought a uh, uh, Z50 for, yeah, for, nice. for my brother and I. I actually, um, I got, I went to the hospital riding it the first day. Whiskey throttled it and hit a ditch and uh, yeah, we uh, didn't slow us down. Still into, into riding. We did more off-road stuff. Yeah. used to go I'm, I'm from pennsylvania and we used to go up to the coal coal region and ride off-road trails and stuff and i loved it, it was, i was pretty into bmx as a kid yeah. and and mountain biking as well and riding moto off-road just feels like you're going downhill for three hours as long as you ride so it's yeah if, if you get enduro right and you the, the trails set up for it i mean it feels super similar to a downhill mountain bike like the way that the bike obviously it's like a lot bigger and heavier but i mean you can kind of replicate the feeling eh? yeah i mean the trail that you're riding is very similar i don't like to do this like pushing my bike uphill type of riding yeah. but you know single track on a on a dirt bike is, is super fun i love doing it have you ever done any like enduro races or anything like that i've done a few and i've done a couple more hair scrambles yeah. like in the winter time I live in North Carolina now, and in the southeast, there's hair scramble you can do almost every weekend. Yeah, okay. I kind of love going out there. It's like a one-day affair. A lot of times when I, especially at the level I do at mountain biking, you spend so much time to do one race. I could hop in my van, drive to a race, ride for two and a half hours until I can't hold on anymore, load up the bike, and go home. And it's like one day, you got to ride as much as you possibly could have, and then you're, you're on your way home. Yeah, there, there is definitely something super fun about enduros like we've got a race coming up in a couple of weeks like it's a we're just copying one of the events that i love doing at home and it's just eight hours you got a three-man or a four-man team and it's like a 20-minute enduro motocrossy kind of loop and you just have a transponder and that transponder has to go around the loop as many times and 
it's the best because like you don't know who's winning. There's just everyone's so there's like six hundred bikes going around. It's like it's a race without being a race. And you just ride all fucking day. And I just that stuff got me back into riding in general because it's like there's such a even in promoting this, there's like, oh, would this be a good first race? Would this be like, do you think I could do it? It's like, this is actually the easiest racing that you could possibly do. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. I mean, that's the most fun style of racing. Sometimes when it's so competitive, like a fraction of a second ruins your day. And yeah. A race like this, you know, <laughs> yeah. everybody has fun. Uh, and the thing is like, you just don't know even where you're at. So like at a point you kind of stop caring, at least for me, I'm like, I'm not really here to win. I'm just here to kind of like ride the track because racetracks always get different to just trail riding tracks. You know, I think, I don't know. I think there's something I like about the racetrack getting gnarlier and gnarlier as the day gets on. Like you kind of can't replicate that when you just go ride with your friends, but you don't want the shit to come with it of like super competitive, like stressing about gate drops and all that sort of stuff. This is just like, pressure off yeah man I, I i need to figure out a way to come do it well we're doing um we're doing one i don't know where i think it's in florida okay but we're doing one december 9th and it's uh at Stu baylor do you follow Stu? Baylor? oh yeah yeah, yeah. so i go at, to his track all the time he lives in south carolina so is that where the shoals is yeah oh well, then that's where we're doing the race i'll, I'll be there <laughs> i thought it was florida <laughs> for some reason no i go right over there all the time i know Stu pretty well Dude. oh that's sick yeah yeah so because you're from or now you live in that area. Yeah, I live in North Carolina and on, right on the border of South Carolina. So yeah. I can get down to Stu's in less than two hours. Dude, that's so sick. Well, then you'll definitely come to the I'll race. be there. Yeah. You have like a full crew? Uh, no, I'll, <laughs> I'll be there fixing my own bike. And I'll probably invite some of the other boys to come, like Luke, yeah. Luca Shaw and his brother. Um, they, they often come ride with us too. Chris Grice is another guy who races World Cups with us. And normally all us mountain bikers go ride together. So try to get them to come dude team team dh for the win yeah well, i don't know about for the win but <laughs> we'll definitely be having the most fun dude that's so cool so yeah so december 9th i mean i don't know if you're around but we we haven't officially announced it but whatever i guess this can be the announcement but um yeah it should be super super fun like and i'm so pumped for this one in mesquite i think the track's gonna get gnarly though yeah yeah i mean it's amazing how a track that sometimes isn't even prepped just bikes on it in the woods how how rough it gets or sometimes even the turns get so good like yeah. no water's been put down yeah and you have the sickest ruts just through a single track in the woods yeah i think it's because like you get so many bikes going through it, it just like brings the moisture that's probably why the woods are always pretty good because it's like not the foliage yeah just it's not getting it. beat in the sun yeah 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 that makes sense like have you ever rode mountain bikes in Cairns? like would you have been to world cups and stuff in Cairns? yeah i did all the world cups in Cairns, and when i was there i did a little bit of other riding too like shuttling off the highway yeah, that yeah. Trail what tracks did you ride i don't remember the name of it but it was like you hop the guardrail off of the Coranda. Yeah, yeah yeah that's yeah, it yeah no yeah. i i grew up in Cairns, and so yeah that's what just made me think then i was like yeah all the downhill tracks were always like some of the sections were you'd get especially on Coranda, that's the track i did the most runs at but you get into like the open sort of fire road that's dusty but everywhere else like the bottom section would just always be wet from yeah. i mean kind of this makes sense why they call it rainforest but, <laughs> yeah. but yeah i'm frothing for the for the event at stews like i think the turnout's going to be crazy and he'll just put on the sickest track as well oh yeah dude Stu spends more time in the tractor than he does riding his dirt bike <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's what I'm looking forward to. Like, I want to be the old dude with a huge property, and everyone just drives past and is like, "That guy is just always on his track." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's fun. Like, it's some of the most fun times you can spend is being creative, making stuff. Like, when you have the vision for how you want the track to be, I imagine Stu like has so much fun building those tracks. Well, so that whole North Carolina, South Carolina region is become a massive hub eh? like mountain biking and motocross supercross like you got the nascar stuff there it's actually a wild place to be if you've got anything to do with wheels these days yeah for sure i mean for a while a lot of the off-road motorcycle guys were there yeah yeah uh, that's kind of where a lot of the base was yeah like caleb russell lives about two hours from me not very far just through the mountains um, and he has a training facility up there 
And then, um, yeah, I moved down there to be able to ride my bike full time. When yeah. I was grew up in Pennsylvania, I couldn't really ride as much in the winter. And the mountains were bigger in North Carolina, and we hardly ever get snow. You can ride every day of the year. So that's why I moved down there. And obviously, NASCAR has been going on for a long time. I know a couple people involved with that now. So. Yeah. Do you go to any of those races? I've never been to one of the races. I started following it a lot more closely after a friend of mine um, who works at a NASCAR team offered to help me with some 3D scanning of my yeah. bike. He he worked. He's worked for one of the NASCAR teams. Um, it's funny. I went there and he was like, you can't film any of the logos. You can't say what team it is. Like, don't say that we helped you. But I got approval that I can help you after work. So That's so sick. They didn't want to show, like, other teams what resources they had. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, he, he offered to, like, 3D scan my bike. He works in aerodynamics for them, and they use these 3D scanners. It's, like, way more accurate, obviously, than measuring things. And uh, I went in, and, and he scanned, like, several of my prototypes for me, which was super cool. And then after that, I started – I followed their team and watched some of their races, and I think they won, like, two or three races this year. So I got a little bit more into it. Man, you should try and get to a race. Like, they sound so fucking good. Like, every sport <laughs> – I don't know if you follow, do you follow F1 and like that sort of stuff? Yeah, I watch those races a little more. The, the sound is just goes down and down, quiet and quiet and quiet. NASCAR, bro, they're just like, how the fuck can we make these things as loud <laughs> as humanly possible? And there's something, basically you spend the whole event with earplugs in. And I just think that's kind of right. Yeah. <laughs> like, it feels like everyone's trying to get away from that. And NASCAR's just like, nah, bro. Like, yeah. we are going to send it. Yeah, embrace it. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully I can. I'd love to. The uh, One of my friends, he started racing this year. He did the first ever street circuit. Was it, was it in Charlotte? Or where was that? I'm not sure where it was. Oh, that, and he flew over and, and did that. He ended up winning the race because it's kind of like touring star. Yeah. Uh, touring car style like australia and so now he's signed a full time no nascar way. drive out of it so yeah he's just moved over i think he's living in in charlotte as yeah. well but um yeah so i i kind of always was into it thought they were cool but until i actually went to one i was like holy shit this is pretty sick yeah that's awesome man they just the i guess like the that, yeah, they just, it's such an old school form of racing. Like, there's, you see so much change in so much other sports, and they just went, like, no. Like, we're even, I guess they're kind of, they do make changes, but it's just not as drastic as other sports, you know. That I think there's something pretty cool in that. Yeah. It, it almost um, is, makes it way harder when there's less variables. Yeah, like, true way. Eh? There's not as much opportunity to make big, big gains. So it comes down to those little details. I'm sure it's really difficult to get an advantage in that sport. Well, and that's what's always kind of been wild to me about downhill is that you would think that there's so many variables in that sport when you look at like the top to the bottom, when you walk down the run and at the end of it all, it's always so insanely close. But you would think that there's so many more variables, right? I think there is. I think we're just, the sport's getting more involved. All the bikes are getting pretty good. Um, you, you spend four days there at the track walking it after mm. each practice session, and all the top riders are getting everything they can out of the track. So in the end, like, the best guys are going to be pretty close. And I think the sport's just getting more and more evolved to where there, there aren't those big gaps anymore. Yeah, no, it's so true. So let's talk about the, the frameworks, I guess, like the overall project. How far back could you take it? So like we could start talking about the frame and the design and all that sort of stuff. But where is this first idea? Like how far back could you throw the football to start talking about this? Um, I've, I've always messed around with some engineering programs to like look at options to make the bikes that we had better. Um, when, when I was racing for other teams. So I, I gained a little bit of knowledge from it then and had often looked at other designs than, than we were really using to see, like, what kind of numbers we could get out of that. Yeah. So I'd always had, like, dream bikes or stuff that I'd made on a computer for fun to see how it would look. But at, at a certain point, it, I guess it became an idea to, like, man, maybe I could actually make one of these myself. And even the first time I wanted to make one, I... I wasn't fully committed to, uh, to doing the project. I was like, oh, I could make this prototype and I could ride it. And 
you know, if, it, if it's a total piece of shit that I can mm. just not tell anybody, <laughs> yeah. nobody will notice. So. It's, it's funny because that in surfing is such a thing. Like I made my own surfboard one time. And it was the exact same philosophy of, I was like, I'm just going to, I just want to catch a wave on this thing, you know, like to play a guitar you made or to surf a, a board that you made. It's just something like soulful and kind of like hippie about it, you know. But to do that for a downhill bike, it's such a different level <laughs> to make something like that happen, you know. I, yeah, I mean, there's definitely a few more moving parts, but it's what I was, had expertise in, so I would have a way easier time doing that than making a surfboard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fair. So I guess what what strikes the interest? Like you've got to have – I feel like there's something in your personality or just like something in the way that your brain works to make you want to go to the lengths to build your own bike. Like how many dudes do you know at your level, like the elite World Cup level where they honestly just could not give a fuck what they rode as long as they were just riding their bike, you know? So it's like, what's different from you to that guy? Yeah. Some, some days that would make e racing a lot easier, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. I feel like I went down the road of like, uh, thinking too much about the bike and like on certain teams I rode for, I rode for the Scott team for I think 15 and 16 and we struggled a lot with the bike and through that I learned so much about it like why I didn't like it huh. what things we could do to try to improve it and I think it affected my racing a lot like if I could have just forgot about it and, and rode it like I think before I ran into struggles at the first race on that bike I qualified fourth so I obviously did pretty well yeah and then started to experience some struggles and got in my head that I didn't like the bike and I couldn't get out of my head and I think a lot of racers could probably relate to that yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, but through that whole process, I learned so much about what things affected the way that the bike rode. And I think I just kind of became a student of it yeah. and took a, a lot of interest in the engineering side of it, more than maybe some of the other riders would have gone that deep with. And through all that, I learned how I thought I could make my own bike. And um, I don't know, I just... I wanted to give it a try, and I, I didn't really have any roadblocks along the way. Like, no, nothing big popped out and was a reason that I couldn't do it. So I just kept trucking along. And there's obviously just, like, something you enjoy, too, about the process, or there's something that, like, captures your attention. Because, I mean, I feel like I've always say, like, part of the fun for me is, like, trying to set up my bike when I'm riding because I'm not – that good at riding so it's not like i'm robbing myself of anything you know what i mean so like if i just went out and rode i'm gonna go the same speed as if i tinker with my bike and try and it gives me almost like something to think about or focus on while i'm riding and there's a, like a process there that is kind of fulfilling is it the same or is it purely just i just want the best bike possible I would say maybe a combination. Like yeah. when, whenever I've gotten one of the bikes that I designed and got to ride it the first day, there's no better feeling in the world. Like even races that I've done really well at or won in the past, like the feeling of hopping on that bike for the first time and it performing the way that you expected it to is just so cool. Like I've gotten bikes before um, delivered after dinner and I'd up till three o'clock in the morning building the bike because I like I was so stoked. Like the amount of stoke level was just so high and then up at eight o'clock riding it the next morning because i couldn't wait and there's not a lot of things in life that get you that fired up yeah true eh? designing your own bike and finally getting it is uh is so cool so that was definitely super motivating um and looking more into like the design side i was really interested in all the numbers like when mm. you're designing a mountain bike you're balancing like leverage ratio geometry axle path there's couple other acceleration and deceleration forces and then the way the chassis flexes the weight of the bike and when I could actually modify it myself in the yeah. in the programs like I was like how can we get the best balance of all these numbers and then comparing it with other bikes that I've ridden and know how they feel so it's like a win when you can like get this 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 and this all in one bike and then you go ride it and it's like wow that actually that worked. actually worked yeah. yeah did would you say that you were adept at testing 
your whole life riding? Like when you were a kid, were you messing with bikes and setups and settings and things like that? Or is it something that purely come out of the frustration from like a racing standpoint? No, I'd say I just learned it over the years. Yeah. Like um, I, I, this is my 15th season racing World Cups. And the first season I literally bolted my bike together and rode it. You know, there was no, we, we had spring forks then. So you didn't have to check the air pressure. Just yeah. check the tires and go. And uh, it was a lot easier then, as I said before. Like sometimes as a racer, it's like better not to think about that stuff. And then um, I rode for Trek the first five years of my career and got to do some testing with them. Like some of the engineers would come out and um, like we went from the aluminum version of the bike to the carbon fiber version. And that was at a time when that was like a new thing. And when we went to that carbon fiber version, they had some things that they wanted to test first before committing to the mold. So I got to ride yeah. like a few different geometry options and a few different um, kinematics options. So I learned a little bit then, got a little bit of a feel for it, but it was really when I switched from the Trek to the Scott and started to struggle with the bike that I had like frustration of trying to tune it that I learned a lot more. And is it because the Scott was so much worse than the Trek in terms of like the the way that it felt and you had such a direct comparison? A lot so, yes. <laughs> it's like a deposition. <laughs> You're like, uh, how do I answer this as, as like politically correct as possible? Uh, no, I mean it was I, – I was the one that wanted to change at that point. Like I, I could have rode the Trek in 2015 and – I wanted to go ride for the Scott team. I wanted to change. It was the first time I ever changed teams in my career. So it was new and exciting. Also uh, had like when I test rode the bike, there was some new suspension that I could have rode on the track too, but it was like at that time a new development. So with that bike and the new suspension, I was like, wow, this feels pretty good. Yeah. And was like excited about the move. And then once I like got deeper into it, got to races, there was just things that I was struggling with on it. And um through that, though, like, I wouldn't change any of that. I probably, like, my 2014 season was my best season racing. I had several top fives, podium. I got fourth at Worlds. And then I went pretty far backwards the next year when I jumped on the Scott. And um, as I would have liked to continue on the sex success I had the year before, I learned so much through through the bike stuff mm. that year. Um, we had a really good resource. His name's Ben Walker, who was, like, the – intermediate between the riders and the engineers at Scott. He used to be a pro free rider himself oh, and was sweet. like helped so much to like explain to me, like he's not an engineer. So sometimes it's hard to understand that as a rider, like communicate in the same terms. And he could, could communicate those feelings that I was having on the bike with the numbers of that the engineers were looking at. So he was a huge resource. And even though I took a step back in my racing, I like gained so much knowledge that I probably wouldn't never gain if I didn't go that route. Yeah, and, and there is always such a, like, how many times, I mean, referring to Moto, where you'll see, like, a dude goes to a new team and they're so excited and they ride the black once and they're like, this is the dream boat that I've been searching for. And then it's like, as soon as the honeymoon's over, you're like, well, the day I rode it, the track wasn't like this or the track was like this. And the there's so much more that goes into a bike than that first one time that you ride it. And when you want to switch teams, when you want to change, when you want a fresh environment, like there's your judgment can get clouded <laughs> so totally. easily, you know. I mean, you can make the lap times what you want when you test ride them both. The one you like more, you're going to ride faster. And what was, I guess, what was in it in the Scott that you saw or like how was it a completely different design like in terms of like the pivots and stuff like that, or was it like a similar bike? Yeah, that Scott was a single pivot bike. So oh, okay. there's just, it had a linkage driving the shock, but there's just a lot less things that you can do as far as like the feel under braking. Um, you're just more limited to what you can change with it. And I think at that time, the Trek was really good. And it, it, was like it was pretty good back then, huh? Pretty far ahead of, of other bikes. Like the Trek that we had in 2014, that was right when everybody was switching to 27.5. Yeah. We got a new bike before the season. It was, really light it was um the suspension worked awesome and yeah i didn't appreciate it enough then i <laughs> in the moment i wish i would have realized what i had that time what what would you say like the current state of mountain bikes are in general in terms of 
like performance parity between brands, disparity between brands? Is it like fairly level or is there still a gap of like these bikes are so much better than these bikes? I think a lot of them share similar components now. So a lot of the components are really good. Um, And there's so many good bikes out there to choose from. But they definitely have their own goals when they come to ride quality. And unfortunately now I think a lot of it's driven by design as well. Like when you look at motocross bikes, they they don't all look different just to be different from the next one. Mm. And you can't really cover a mountain bike with with a body panel or plastics or other things that other vehicles can. So um, unfortunately I do think that a lot of design influence, and and that's tied to sales too. Like they can probably sell more bikes that look cooler than than bikes that are just only looking at numbers, not looking at how the bike actually looks. Like mountain bike engineering blends art with engineering in an interesting way. Sometimes I think I'm in the wrong sport. (laughs) Yeah, and I was actually going to get your thoughts on moto design. Like, because it is, it seems like we are kind of stuck in a box. And I, I wonder, because I don't know anything about engineering, I wonder, is that box just a place where manufacturers are like comfortable and they kind of understand that area that they're locked into? And it's like maybe over here there is another box that would produce better, slightly better, like, you know what I mean? But it's they all kind of stay in that same lane. And then that does mean that they're, the design factor doesn't come into it as much because the design is kind of around like the fairings and the plastics as opposed to the actual frame and geometry. Yeah, I don't know as much about motorcycle design, but I think there's a lot more parameters as far as like they have to race production bikes a lot, at least here in the US. Um, And they they take something that works well and just refine it. Like the bikes or even the shock design is is not totally different to what they had 20 years ago. No, not at all. But they just find little ways to make it better each year. And And in a lot of ways, I wish we did that in mountain biking instead of, rushing the new product to market and then scrapping it for a new one as soon as it's uh, as soon as it's been released. Um, there's a lot to be said for that year after year making marginal gains and you, you end up with something that works really well at the end of it. I think it's tough to go into a new area with with something like that and there's going to be growing pains. Mm. There's some resistance to like go go to something totally different for, for those guys because it's going to take time to figure it out. Yeah. I, I remember um, when there was a, one of the MXGPs like years ago in the U.S., I think it was the 90s, I read an article about it. I think it was Bob Hanna raced like a linkage motorcycle then, which was totally different, yeah. something, something unique. And because it was, a, it was a GP, he could race it at that, at that round, and it wasn't an AMA race. But um, you don't really see stuff like that too often anymore. No, I think this year I went to one of the GPs and Roman Fevra had like a full custom frame basically. Like from what I remember, the like the top, uh, like the head stay basically, all the top spar was based off production, but then like the bottom cradle was all CNC machined. That's and so awesome. he was on this fully custom frame and like it literally sounded different to the other bikes like there was one section i've talked about a few times on here but there was a section after the finish line and it was just huge braking bumps into a 180 rut and it's like that there is pretty good testing for a certain set of forces that go on a motorcycle and like you could just hear that it was like a dull thud over these bumps and everything else was kind of like it just sounded way harsher and the feeling that he would say that it got was just it's so soft through your feet, which like where that cradle was. So I think that's probably something. And I, I feel like the maybe this is another reason why they don't step outside of geometry as much or frames is because you've got motor, you've got hydraulics, you've got braking, like electronics. There's so many other things that you can eke performance out of as well whereas mountain biking it's basically frame suspension brakes you know like there's not as many variables coming through the motor you know so maybe that that's a part of it as well yeah i i I wish we would focus more on suspension too like a lot of bike companies want to do radical things with their design when if you could do something just the small details of matching your wheel rate with your with your shock 
camping, you could make such a difference. And that's what they're looking at in, in moto a lot, which I think they can get a lot out of. So what what are we talking about there? Like break that down for me. So just um, the the force that your your axle is is producing, which is um, the linkage of your bike plus your spring. That's your wheel rate, and then the damping in your shocks. So the force that the oil restriction creates, you can match those two to work together really well. You can get a really good feel out of your bike without doing something extreme like putting a high pivot on it or idler pulley or just making a different layout, like just matching those two things can make such a difference. And how would you do that? Would you do that basically through shims in the rear shock and just make sure, like how would you measure those two forces together? Like I'm I'm assuming that the axle force would be quite easy to measure, but how would you measure the shock? So you would, when I've done it before with Fox, we'll send them a plotted force of our frame so they can see at every millimeter of axle movement what that's doing to the shock as far as leverage goes. Yeah. And then you can choose what spring you want to use, and that kind of has its own force that holds yeah. you up. And then they'll use a dyno to just measure what the shock's doing. And there's a few things they can do. I don't know as much about the in, ins and outs of the in, inside of the shock, but shims would do it. Um, yeah. oil. The, the base valve, the oil. Yeah. Um, basically just simply put, like, restricting the oil, like the amount of force it takes for the oil to move through the shock, matching, matching that with your frame, you can... You can do a lot. Huh. Yeah, I've never heard it explained like that. That's actually super cool. Yeah, it's like a simple detail that sometimes is overlooked. Yeah, because I wonder, um, yeah, I'm just going to ask my guy like, <laughs> what, <laughs> if that's like how. Because so one of my friends, Mark Johnson, he um, he does REP suspension. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I've been in the... I've been in his workshop when he's done one of my shocks and he's got it on the dyno and he's just got like this massive spreadsheet of numbers and it's all formulas and then he's like just punching it in. You're just like, holy shit, dude, this is pretty crazy. And that, then it's so hard because you've got to feel that on the track and then you go from something so mechanical to then and you're almost trying to like match yourself to the setting and then provide feedback and like there's such a huge like that variable for error <laughs> in yeah, that totally. process right there. I mean try to hit the same bump every time the same way even with the same shock is hard. So to do it with two different shocks and explain the difference um, sometimes is a hard thing to do. So what do you think mountain biking suspension could do to improve? Like do you think that there's low hanging fruit there? I do. Um, I think a lot of times it's driven again by sales. So like they want a lot of external adjustments. Um, they can say that the bike on the showroom floor has uh, high speed and low speed compression rebound. So four ways of adjustment when we don't really need all that. I think you can, um, <laughs> yeah. and it doesn't always do exactly what it says either. Like just because you have that doesn't mean, and, and a lot of the customers wouldn't even know if it did what it said. You can have a simpler shock and do a lot more inside the shock. Um, just, it takes more resources, but just tuning the, the shock for each bike. Yeah. Rather, a, a lot of companies too, it's easier. Um, most of their sales are, are OEM, so they'll create a product that they have to sell to a product manager, and they will try to win the bid by making them happy so they spec it on their bike mm. and making it easy to tune for a variety of sizes. Um, like one shock for, for all riders is easier to sell when you could – dial it in for the intended use a little bit easier and a little bit more simply if it didn't have to cover such a wide range. And so you you would rather, like, so what's the fix for that? Like, so do you think that companies should focus, like, let's say you had a suspension company and you were, like, making your own suspension for your own bike. What are you doing differently on that bike? Um, depending on what customer is looking for it, I would – just work with them to make it specific for yeah and i don't i don't really know enough about like sales either like it's it is tough because if you sell the shock it needs to work for a variety of body types but doing it for racing anyway just figuring out what who's using it what their what their weight is what their speed is um and creating a shock that didn't have as much external adjustments and was just kind of set up to match the forces of that that are being put into it yeah yeah we did um I, it's it's so true that you say that like i got a set of 
Showa A kit for my KTM and you get them out of the box and it's like, yeah, they feel pretty good, but they're just not even close. And then after, like I rode, I rode for probably two months on them and then once they really bed in, once the oil gets old, like they just turned into unrideably soft. And it's like it took working with a guy from Showa, revalve, fresh oil. And then we were, when we were, I think he made one valving change, but the biggest change that I could actually feel on the track was he just removed a bit of oil. Mm -hmm. And that that gave the best feeling that it had all day, you know. So, yeah, even like the best, most expensive suspension that you can buy basically, it's – taking a little bit of oil out and it's like just doing these little things that actually makes the difference you know yeah and if you're working now that you know that that's the feeling you're looking for it's probably easier to replicate the second time yeah we literally did on my other bike i was like it just feel like it it would feel like halfway through the stroke it just got super hard like and uh out of balance with like the actual like this wasn't progressive at that point it was like a, it ramped up super quickly so yeah, we just took ten mil oil out of the that set of forks too. It's like, all oh, right, sweet. Like yeah. that actually makes a huge difference, you know. Yeah, and, and one thing we've been doing on the bikes too is recording a lot of the the data. So we'll record all of our runs at World Cups. Um, a lot of times, not. Oh, even, really? Yeah. Even in run, race runs? Um, I've done it a lot in quality runs. Okay, yeah. not as much in race runs. Um, but I have done some race runs for sure, and and at U.S. races, I've done it a lot in racing, and just to have like the shaft speed. Um, recorded we can correlate like what a good feeling was to a one that we didn't like and um if you would have had that on the track the day that you liked the suspension you'd probably yeah. be a lot easier to replicate that and tell uh, them like so hey, you just he, take that one data to the next track and then try and replicate. Well, if it's feeling bad you can compare yep. the two and be yep. like hey this day it was feeling good this is the numbers that we had this is how the shock was moving this day it's not feeling good what what's the difference okay. yeah I wonder how much data acquisition you can get in Moto. Um, I, I feel like I've seen a, a KTM test track before, but it's like way more bulky and way different to use. Or maybe they just it hasn't made its way into the sport in the like it's not as accessible as maybe it is in mountain biking. I'm not sure. You know, I don't know a lot about how they do it for Supercross. I'm sure they have test riders that can record yeah. a lot of the stuff yeah. and, and sort through everything. That way the the, the pros only have um, less options to work through. Yeah. But I, I'm sure they know exactly what the shaft speeds are. Yeah. What's the, um, like, the company that makes the stuff that you guys use? Does the suspension companies make their own, like, uh, testing kits essentially? The suspension companies don't. There's there's two that we use. Uh, one's called Motion Instruments, and the other is BYB Tech. And we've been using the BYB one more. Now they're um, they're more accessible. Like I think a kit's less than two thousand dollars. Really? And you get the potentiometer, which is like the tracer that measures the shock and the fork. Yeah. And the data logger as well. Like back in the day, people had to build their own kits. You just got like a, a data logging box that had as many inputs as you wanted, and then you can plug what it, like it's not just for bikes could be used for anything yeah and that's what like loic and his mechanic they built their own years ago and they were the only ones doing it huh. and now there's available to the public systems that you can buy which is why you see more people using it now yeah right it would be interesting to try and do it because i'm sure like the factories have like i mean i've seen it at test tracks and stuff like that but i wonder because the average person i think as well just doesn't really think that they're like capable or qualified, which like essentially they're kind of not, but there is a process. Like at, at one point you weren't this knowledgeable about all of this. And it's like, you just kind of go through this process. Like, I wonder if there is a lot to gain for like the average moto dude that's into it and wants to learn this stuff in getting a kit or like building a kit and logging their own data and like trying to figure it out. I think there's definitely marginal gains to be made. I think you can you can do a lot before going that deep. Yeah. And, and as you know, man, sometimes all the electronics are more headache than they're worth. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think um, the biggest thing sometimes people make a mistake with is wanting to make changes with it before getting a lot of data points. Like that was one thing we did. We like 
for the first year we we just recorded a lot we didn't mm. we didn't really like look at every run and say like oh what's the bike doing we need to change something you like it, it's hard enough to be consistent without changing anything so we just tried to record a lot of data see just to have it just to look over and then start to get some correlations of what we liked and what we didn't like before rushing into changes yeah so you were and were you using the data as like correlation causation kind of thing so you would take the data and then compare it with how you felt and we using that to then like build up your own feeling or intuition in a sense yeah in a lot of ways yeah i'd look at days that i i was happy with the bike and other days that i wasn't and try to just pick some like correlations as to why and so all right were you good at this stuff at school as well <laughs> <laughs> like were you is math and geometry and like or is this stuff that is just purely learned through – because I think people can learn a lot through just like the want to learn something. No, I mean I my last math class was in 10th grade. I, <laughs> I My last two years of high school, I missed a lot of school to go racing. I was um, going and racing the junior category. So I did online school for one year and then my senior year went back to my high school but just missed so many days that like I didn't – I didn't. I wasn't planning to go to college, so I didn't take a lot of stuff like algebra two in tenth grade is like a pretty basic course. <laughs> and I laughed because um, I was talking to my friend from Santa Cruz, and he was sending me some uh, some of their bikes that they were working on, and saying like, "Oh, this is a little bit too progressive." And I looked at, it, I was like, "It's not as progressive as you say. How are you guys doing that calculation?" And I told him like, "This is how I do it. It's like starting minus ending divided by starting is like to rate of change." And he's like, oh, we were doing it wrong the whole time. Like, you were right. And I was like, well, I took math class, algebra 2 in 10th grade. If you've got any more questions, just let me know. <laughs> Dude, that's insane. <laughs> so uh, all the stuff with the bike, I just figured out. Like, if you're passionate about something and, and you like it, and, and you can feel the difference when you're riding the bike, and it's easy to start to understand and, and learn what those things do. Man, that's so cool because I think people – could maybe look at you and listen to you talk now and like you're so knowledgeable and you've come so far in that that journey or like that lane and people just would put that down to like oh this guy's super fucking smart and <laughs> he's always been like this but it's so cool that you're this is purely just out of like passion and interest because it's pretty insane what a person can achieve purely with that level of passion and drive to want to know something yeah no, i appreciate that man i mean yeah i just i just love doing it and i've tried to apply myself the best that i can i think a lot of people could do so much if they just apply themselves yeah what out of the box kind of stuff did you do to learn a lot of this um i, I really just like talking and asking questions a lot like I had access to a lot of engineers from brands that I rode for I rode for five factory teams when I was racing and working with them on the bikes like I just asked questions and started to try to understand the what they were saying and, and feeling on the bike and I think that put me in a spot where I was a little bit powerful because I could feel the bike and ride it but also understand it it's hard to have both. Like yeah. there's a lot of engineers who can explain it but could never get themselves into that situation yeah. that you're trying to describe. And there are a lot of riders that could describe the situation but could never understand on the other side. Yeah. So through through both, I, I think I put myself in a unique spot where I had like the knowledge on both ends of it. Yeah, yeah. So to go back to the feeling though, how would you say you learned the feeling on the bike and then to kind of translate it like are you because some guys just don't really feel anything i mean you probably know guys that could win with loose handlebars yeah. you know so that it's not <clears throat> common in a sense but i don't think it's like a talent that you're necessarily born with like you either have it or you don't i think it kind of comes down to like actual focused attention and some people do or don't want to spend that focus attention but so i guess like how did you develop that um i think just a lot of test sessions and opportunities to work with with the either the teams or a lot of times the suspension companies too um going to a test session like i've done a lot for tires as well with um different tire brands that we've ridden for in the past you'll go for a day you'll do 10 runs on the same track you'll fill out a form after each one about 
like every every um, detail about how the ride quality was, like harshness, grip, um, predictability. Like you go through all these things, and you, I, I would always try to give like my best answer. And if you don't know, you just say you don't know if you yeah. feel it. But I'd say like just going having the opportunity to go through a lot of those test sessions. Some of it was for racing, some of it was for product development. Even um, I just feel like that helped me a lot. Just looking trying to be analytical about what I felt, not make something up, try to take emotion out of it, ride on your side as consistently as possible. Um, Because if you can't do the same run twice, then you can never know if it was the bike doing it or if it was you. And just try to, yeah, be be honest with what you feel. Um, Don't make stuff up. I think a lot (laughs) of guys, like, it's really hard to take your emotion out of it when you're racing as well. Um, like you, you want something to feel a certain way or you, you associate something with a, a positive experience, like a good race that you had or one that maybe you crashed mm. and maybe it was your fault, but not the bike, but you don't like that because you had a bad experience with it. I think that's sometimes pretty hard to do and you got to be pretty honest with yourself to figure all that stuff out. Yeah. Cause I mean, there's guys, there's dudes winning supercross races right now. And if you talk to the people on the teams and you talk to the crew that builds bike they're like you guys got no fucking idea (laughs) like they could never say it but they're just like yeah he has no clue what he wants out of his motorcycle that's why you see what you see if the guy can can trust the people he's working with then sometimes it works really well i think they have more people around them and in motorsports than we do in mountain biking yeah it's like a trend almost now in mountain biking for the next generation wants to puzzle with the bike like i don't know if it was greg menar leading that charge or if it's just what people do now but they want to just mess with their bike and change things all the time and if you don't have the resources to do it sometimes it's it's like a, a road of diminishing returns yeah who who gets it right from the top downhill dudes that you see like who do you think has a really good balance between like their bikes always super dial but they're not always chasing it i i was gonna say loic but he is always chasing it he gets it right though he's <laughs> yeah. got the people around him yeah um i'd say a lot of times you look at guys like troy like he's so, he he rides so well he's so good on the bike he's light on his feet and he doesn't seem to be always looking for something else I think guys that can take responsibility for themselves and not always be looking for something out of the bike or blaming the bike or chasing something like at a certain point at a world cup you're you're setting a bike up for a run that you may not be riding the same conditions in. Like you're going to go faster. There's going to be some yeah. heightened nerves. Um, you you might be rushing a little bit, and the track might be more blown out. So you, you have to kind of guess what the setup's going to be. But most of that comes down to you. Like the the bike is a small part of it, and you got to make it be predictable and do what you expect. But most of that is down to the rider and the guys who accept that and are like, okay, the bike is good. I'm I'm gonna take the responsibility on my shoulders I, I think those guys have less headaches with that stuff and did you that's what i was going to ask before when you were talking about testing or like capturing data in race runs can you see the difference in a race run when the pressure's on and the clock's on and it's the the lights are on basically you know like there has to be a difference between a test run and a race run. yeah i mean stuff's just not as smooth like you yeah. a lot of times we'll go like one psi more in the tires or something because you, you, you're nervous and like you might come in a little late to something, break later, turn harder, like you're, you're rushing through that run. And it's hard not to do, and you have to do it in some sense. Uh, you go deeper off of a drop or a jump um, and you just need the bike to be predictable enough in that situation to keep you going forward. Yeah, because the, I mean, I noticed that at World Vets this year, like I don't race much. And I was so shit in the first race. I was so bad. I'm like, dude, I've been riding more than I ever have in my whole life. And I suck so bad right now because there's just something that happens in that moment. Obviously, guys that are at the top level, they're doing it way regularly. And they're at the top for a reason. Like they can obviously like partition to a certain degree. But I think no matter what, there is like that's why you go racing, you know. And there's so many guys that you – see that are just like the smoothest cleanest dudes in practice but they're not like the race run guys and then you some guys just they know how to flick that switch yeah it's such a big sport part of it in any sport especially downhill like you see some guys that like the pressure 
makes them rise to the next level. I'd say like Loic or Greg Minar are so good at that. Like when Loic smells blood, he's like, he's on. And then other guys like Loris, is, he's such a talented rider. He's probably the best on the bike when you watch him ride of any of the guys in the race. But as far as the history goes, he's like shit the bed every time it's his turn to win uh, as far as like a championship or something. So it's interesting to see how that affects that mindset it can either help or hinder people. I wonder if they have data of like Lois, uh, Loris's runs, you know, where they could actually see like, dude, in qualifying, you're so much better here or in, in practice or whatever. Like that would be because – in the sense like that data just would literally reveal all of your flaws in a sense, you know? Yeah. I don't, I don't really know on that team what they have. I'm sure Loic does, but uh, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're pretty advanced with that stuff. So Loic really changed the game in a, in a sense, you think, with like the way that he went about bike setup and kind of like chasing the ideal setup? I think so. I think his mechanic, Jack Roar, is really good at that. And unless you have a person like that with you, you can't really do it. Like, I can't look at data and run the test session myself. I need my mechanic with me. Like, I could run a test session for you, yeah. but I can't ride the bike, feel without any bias what I'm feeling, and look at numbers. So for him, he had a really good resource with his mechanic to do that. And they went in pretty early with building their own data system before they were available to the public. So they had like a motorsports aim data logger on the bike, and then they got their own potentiometers, which are available to measure anything that moves, and hooked those up as inputs to their data logger and just started to record stuff. And then they had a good resource with their suspension that they were working with as well. I think they did it even before going to Olin's, but when they went to Olin's, Olin's is used to reading stuff like this. Yeah, like yeah. They're working in motorsports and F1. So when Loic is giving them feedback in, in like real numbers, like I always say, I love to tune my bike in numbers, not vibes. It's like way, way easier to do that way. <laughs> yeah. And those guys started working with that pretty early on, and I think they led the charge. And it's got to give you some kind of psychological advantage too like knowledge is power you know and and if you can trust those numbers and if you can believe that man you can just put so much out of your head yeah absolutely i mean i think that's a big part of his advantage he trusts the bike every time he knows it's going to be right and there's nothing nothing to question there he can focus on his job and put all his energy into that and how much do you think it's sped up the progression? Like just l- let's say just their relationship, just those two dudes working together. Did that ramp up the progression of downhill as a sport, do you think? I think it brought in a lot of professionalism to it. I think a lot of people want to chase that. And sometimes it's, like I said, harder to chase it when you don't have all the resources. So you see a lot of people that will buy, mm, buy the available kits the now. And it's like they'd almost be better off not recording stuff. Like if it's not calibrated perfectly, like the worst thing you can have is wrong information. And if they're <laughs> yeah. building all their base off of wrong information because they don't have enough experience with this stuff or they put it on at a race, like you should show up at a race to race, not to tune your bike or practice. And if they come there with the stuff because they want to look like they've got, they're yeah. doing everything, it's like, what do you have this on for? Is it to look professional or is it because you're really working? And I think in some senses they they led people along to like go the route of trying to record numbers that they didn't know how to do. Yeah. And in in other senses, like some other teams now are pretty good at it. Like I think Common has got a really good grasp on it. They have engineers that help them read the data. Um, now Greg's been working with developing that motion instrument system. Yeah. So he's got a lot of insight on it too. So, um, yeah, we're definitely getting there, but he, Loic was the one that really led the charge. Oh, that's super cool to know. Cause when I was racing downhill as just a kid, the bikes were so shit yeah. by comparison. Like I had a, and I mean, it was gangster. Like I had an intense M1 back in the day and I had the Fox shock in it. I never had the fifth element shock. That's the one that I always wanted. Yeah. But um, like in comparison to bikes now, and I mean, you could probably like, I guess you're a better person to ask, but like when did bikes get good from that? But the progression to go from like that intense M1 now to like whatever the best, like your bike, 
right now. There's such a crazy big progression in that time. And it's, it's kind of mind blowing that an industry can go that far that quickly in a sense, or at least that's like my outside perspective. Yeah. I mean, it's a young sport. So that M1 you had was probably only 10 years after the sport really started. Yeah. And now we're 20 years past that. Like if you look at the beginning of motorcycles, it probably was a similar progression. I'd say now all the components are so good too. Like the bike you had back then, it's probably rare you did a full day of riding without breaking it. Oh, dude. My dad hated downhill mountain bikes with a passion. He was like, the world's shitter sport. You have to, you go up to the top of the hill and it takes like 25, 30 minutes to get to the top and then you get three minutes down. You see them for one second. Like yeah. it's just everything breaks on the thing. They're so expensive. So yeah, it was a massive problem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You spend all day to ride the thing for 20 minutes. Oh, yeah. Riding in the car for three hours to get to do that 20 minutes worth of riding. Oh, man, that Coranda track you rode, I would have done thousands of runs down that. And, like, think about the fuel money <laughs> that you spend. Like, we used to have – it used to be the Hannahs. Old man Hannah, he used to be the one that would trailer up, like, six of us, and we'd all just be, like, crammed in there, stinking yeah. like shit, <laughs> zipping up the hill to go down. All all day you'd break something. I wouldn't be able to ride for four weeks because it was like a three hundred dollar part that I had to save up for. Yeah, yeah. I I remember Mick saying he did like forty some runs on that track in one day. Dude, I was around at that time. Like it, he, there was a there was a period of time where he was trying to break the record of how many runs. And his old man used to send it, dude. It was like a. I'm pretty sure it was an old like Ford Falcon. It was a Ford Falcon or a Holden and it had a little box trailer on the back of it. You could look out the back of it <laughs> and the trailer would be like skipping as he was turning. And he would just spend all day from sunup to sundown on that hill. That's awesome too. Mick is one of the nicest guys I've ever met. He's such, For real. such a such a legend. And uh, just to see the dedication that he has. He's just a professional dude. He's so nice, but he uh, – He's one guy that'll do that. If like if there's if you say, who's the guy that did 44 runs today? It's like that's Mick, and he's probably timed everyone and was within two seconds <laughs> on each run. Man, you used to hear crazy stories about like his dad making him ride a BMX bike home from races, or like they they lived in Ballin and Kerr, uh, which was the next. It's like just a, I mean, like a one street kind of town, and then that have. Babinda, which was like the smaller town that was next to the bigger town. And yeah, he used to like ride his BMX bike just for miles and miles and miles and like the amount of runs that they'd do and and he'd be on a road bike flat out. And But even the dad, like old man Hannah, he used to cycle 80 Ks every day up this insane, like it's like the Gillies, kind of like the Coranda range, like where you did runs, but it's on like the south side of town and it's even gnarlier than that hill and he would ride it every single day that's every, awesome like for just like months in a row without taking a day off so like they're just like a gnarly just the disciplines like been bred into them yeah and mick was just the always that guy like he was a powerhouse bmx rider too oh yeah he was the strongest guy on the pedals and downhill for the longest time yeah so now it was it was savage grow or like watching them do what they did and tracy was an animal too like she did basically everything mick did yeah absolutely did you get to go to watch any of the world cups in cairns i got weird luck with that like 96 i can't remember i think we were away like on a family holiday in 96 and then the next one that happened i was living in america and then has it has there been three there's been or two uh, world champs and a couple world cups i did three in my career i did 14 16 as world cups and then 17 was world champs yeah so i was living here that whole time and i just i missed them so i never got to see i raced that track as a kid but i never got to see a a world cup or world champs there Mm. it was such a cool event like one of the only ones we've ever done in in the time when i've been racing it was like a tropical round it was exotic it was like so exciting to go there instead of go to Fort William and stand underneath the rain and freezing cold weather. But you go to Cairns and it's on the beach. And I think I remember before the race, we uh, went to that cable wakeboard park. Yeah, yeah, right. And That's like, like super close all, to the track. We all blew our forearms out doing it. We, <laughs> we told Martin that we were at the beach all day, but we were at the wakeboard park all day. <laughs> <laughs> 
that place was sick, dude. Yeah. Just the whole place was awesome. Cool, and cool it's, vibe there. it's cool that you got to ride in a bunch of other places too because Cairns has so many trails. It's insane how much riding there actually is there. That's awesome, yeah. I hope you go back for one of the crank works. It's cooler doing that now and like looks like they built out the venue. The slope style course and the dual slalom, it looks amazing. Yeah, yeah, I'm frothing to get back there. It's been like way, way too long. But my I'm like family, close like family, family friends with Glenn Jacobs. Yeah. So I just followed him around my entire life as a kid. Like Bryn Atkinson was the man. Then you had like Kavarik and and Ronning was up there all the time. Then you had Hannah, Sean McCarroll. Like the scene when I was a kid growing up there, it was it was like oh, the Temecula of, you know, yeah. <laughs> of like mountain biking for, for a time. There was just the coolest people, the most tracks. And like even now, like you, Cairns has the most vibrant – mountain biking culture and there's tracks that are i think e-bikes opened it up a lot as well because there was a lot of these like big mountain kind of rides that you could do almost like adventure rides where you but you'd have to get shuttled for like three hours to get to the top and then it'd take you kind of like all day to ride down but man you could just every day of the week that'd be a sick ride on a sick track with really good riders yeah that's amazing dude hearing you go through those names like i never thought of it before but all the aussie mountain bikers like the downhill dudes they were fucking men like they were the ones that were <laughs> yeah. leading the charge like they were the gnarliest dudes at the races and just like you think of their name and you're like Fuck, those dudes are cool oh man and i, I was probably like i don't know maybe 12 13 14 so i was like in my that that was like my teenage years of like thinking I was the man, you know, and we'd we just be trying to keep up and trying to hang around and just like these kids that were standing off the side of all like the coolest dudes in, in the sport. And we just thought it was normal, you know, but, and there was like local legends too. Like those were all the guys that were on the world stage and that were killing it. But like Cam Palmer, he was like, as good as those dudes in a lot of ways, but he just didn't really like to race and he didn't really want to do the travel. And then you had like Dennis Bear. He was a ripper. You had like Benny Bramham. He just only <laughs> rode hardtails and he was a ripper as well. So like there was a whole local community as well. Like those guys would go away to the big races and like the World Cups and when they came back, they'd be in all like their team gear and stuff. But it's like when they went, there was still this crazy local crew that was just as good as those guys almost. Yeah, that's amazing, dude. That must have been so cool to grow up there. And some of the tracks, man, like I would love to go back on a good bike being older and just ride some of those tracks as well. Like have you ever heard of the downhill track Water Blower? No, I, ha I haven't. Oh, man. Kansas, it's crazy how under, well, I guess like, I don't know, man, people just don't know a lot of these local trails, but they have like yeah. this crazy section called Rocky Horror it's like one of the gnarliest <laughs> rock gardens you've ever seen. Cliffs on both sides. Like they did a like an underground race there one time. And the, the guy, Dennis Bear, he just fucking sent this section, dude, and just cartwheeled off the hill. And it was like a 45-minute recovery <laughs> mission to, to get this dude, eh? Hey? So, yeah, it was just like oh, just cra crazy scene. But I guess you just have wild mountains there, you know? Yeah. And, man, back then, just, like, the glory days of, like, the start of the sport, it was, like, not as many checks and balances as there are now. What was it like for you around that age? Um, I grew up – I did more BMX racing when I was a kid. It was – when I started mountain biking, the, the lowest category was 18 and under. So there wasn't really bikes for kids like there is now yeah. in, in downhill. So um, I would always like to go to the BMX track, race against kids my own age – it was something that um, I was just motivated to go. And you ra you got instant feedback there because you're racing head-to-head. -head. So if you didn't do it well, the other guys would get ahead of you. So you learn pretty quick, like, how to pump the bike and what inputs to, to give you a drive. Um, so I started with that, and then I did my first mountain bike race when I was 12. And I just loved the fact that it was you against the trail and the clock, mm. and you didn't race head-to-head -head with those other guys. Like, when you get to 12 racing BMX, it's, like, more and more competitive every year. And going to mountain bikes, it was like, you could hang out with these guys, and if they beat you, it was because they were faster. It had nothing to do with them cutting you off or racing head-to-head -head like that. 
So I, I found this the whole scene so much more enjoyable. Yeah, that's one of the big differences in mountain biking that shapes the culture and shapes the the sport because in moto like the guys it's a physical sport like they're actually hitting each other they're like they're causing each other injury and harm like it's so gnarly in that sense and as a result the the whole culture shifts and it's so much more competitive it's like more of a fight sport almost and then you go and i think like surfing's kind of like that as well like surfing would be in the middle between mountain biking and motocross like on mountain biking everyone's pretty cool everyone's friends no one's hitting each other there's no none of that fierce competition in like a physical sense and it's just purely like you said it's you versus everyone else but it's you versus yourself and the clock and it creates such a different culture so it's crazy that i guess you gravitated towards that culture yeah, I, I liked that a lot more. It was just more fun to hang out, um, be a part of the scene in mountain biking. Obviously, like if you have a good line, maybe you don't tell your biggest competitor where you're going or you, you have some sort of that going on. But uh, in, in the end, like I said, if the guys are, are faster than you, it's because they did a better job and you, you got to respect that. There's no taking the line away or trying to do anything psychological. And I, I think just being a part of that sport – Almost every guy, even in the World Cup, is is cool, and it's pretty unique to have a sport that's that's like that. Oh man, definitely! Like you don't see it much in in other sports, and yeah, even surfing, which is supposed to be like the most chilled sport. I mean, it's hyper competitive because the guys are like in the water next to each other. Yeah, yeah, and I guess you're like fighting for position and the wave and everything. Where uh, in downhill, you like you get your start time, you do your warm up, you have your your minute to be on the track and it's uh it doesn't have anything to do with anybody else and so when did the racing stuff sort of start to click like as you got a little bit older and you got into mountain biking like what series and stuff did you cut your teeth on um so i started in like 2005 2006 and that was right about the time when they started putting more like machine built jumps on on some of the mountain bike tracks yeah so coming from bmx i could do a lot of that stuff yeah and i've I was 13 then or 13 or 14 and um, I could be pretty competitive with the 18 and under category at that time just because of like having a background with jumping from BMX. Um, it's funny now I'm like look at other kids coming up and I'm no mean good at, good at jumping. <laughs> yeah. But at that time I, I could, I had I thought I, what I thought was a little advantage. Um, I did a lot of the races in the Northeast so we had like a Mid-Atlantic Cup and then um, there was races at Snowshoe. There's races at yeah. the U.S. Open was at Mountain Creek. I remember watching Sam Hill come there and race. And that was like I would watch the DVDs from Clay Porter or Earth movies. Yeah, dude. Like I would just watch them like on repeat the same DVD every day after school. And you'd see Sam Hill. And then to get to go watch him race the U.S. Open at Mountain Creek, which was only a few hours from my house, was like the coolest thing ever. And I got to meet him and – I think he like destroyed a rim and JC rebuilt it and he signed the rim. I still have it hanging in my garage That's so right sick. now. It said, hold it wide and let it slide. <laughs> dude, you want to talk about a good dude. Oh, absolutely. He is a good motherfucker, that guy. Yeah, just lets his riding speak for itself. Um, yeah, just probably for me, like the my biggest idol in mountain biking. Yeah, he he's just the coolest guy in general too. Like his, there's the, a trait that some people have where they're like, they're effortlessly cool. They yeah. don't try. They put nothing into being cool. They don't want to be cool. They don't give a fuck about being cool. And it makes them so fucking cool. And he's just one of those dudes, you know, like it, when you, I'm lucky enough, I've actually got to spend a bunch of time around him now. And he is just the most genuinely nice person and just not trying at all yeah and it's like it's so fun to be around yeah absolutely i mean i've got to to be around him a little bit definitely not as much as you but just growing up at that time like when i got into it in 06 07 that was when he was on top and like winning world champs and world cup overall in the same year and had just such a different style to everybody else and like you'd watch the way that he rode a bike you'd watch the race and be like that's the guy and uh i don't know at that age like being 14 like you you want to 
gravitate towards that. So what when you look back at that time, what do you reckon made him so special on the bike? Um, I think he had a lot of self confidence, obviously. Like he knew what he could do on the bike. He was really focused. Um technically he was pretty gifted i'd say like he could put the bike exactly where he wanted to um he he was really good in in all the corners like making up a tenth in every turn you get four seconds by the end of the track <laughs> yeah. and he was just quicker around that stuff than everybody else um but yeah i think that's just kind of built on like the confidence that he could do it a couple times and he was doing it differently he was on flat pedals um, he was just riding the gnarlier sections faster than everyone else. So whenever you had a gnarly track, you knew that he was going to be the guy. <laughs> yeah. Do you think he changed the way people rode? I think at, or after that, a lot of people tried to ride flats. But I think his style was so hard to copy. Like, guys tried to copy it and made it worse. Mm. Um, so, I mean, Brendog was his teammate for a while. I got to be teammates with Brendog for a couple of years, and he rode pretty similar. You could see when guy, any guys are teammates in mountain biking, they ride together a lot. They start yeah. to share some things. Um, but I think, yeah, for a while, everybody wanted to copy Sam Hill, but not very many people could do it successfully. And so why do you think that was? Like just talent level or the what he grew up riding? <laughs> it's hard to answer. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, he's definitely got – some talent that nobody else has and just the way that he's able like he's a pretty small guy center, center of gravity smaller like watching him and Greg Menard who battled for many overalls mm. at that time would ride the bike totally differently um and I'd say the, the way that Greg rode or that the way that Sam rode it was cooler like he wanted to see the guy who was riding the gnarly stuff the steep stuff ripping the corners fast and Greg was just so strong and precise and focused and it was like two different ways to go about it. And I'd say the way that Sam did it was better to watch. Um, but, yeah, it's really hard to put a finger on why. I'd say, uh, yeah, he just built confidence over over the, every time he did it well and um, carried that into the races. He was definitely the most confident guy at that time. Yeah, yeah. No, it's interesting that you talk about the size difference too, right? So I think about this a lot in moto and it's to do with just – it's just leverage ratios, right? So you watch, why does James Stewart look so good when he rides? And it's to me and Ricky Carmichael, like those guys, it's because they're small and they're compact and you don't see like the, when they're moving, there's less leverage. Like you just don't see as much movement for like the same input essentially. I might, I'm not a, I'm not as engineering savvy <laughs> as you, but I think that there's kind of something to that in terms of like the way that they look riding the bike. And then, cause you look at a guy like Jet and he's fairly long and he's fairly lanky and he's got long levers and he can affect the bike in, in a different way. And I think that nowadays with the way that technique and the bikes have kind of evolved together. I actually think it's a massive advantage to have those longer levers, but it definitely, when you watch Jet ride, like he just looks smooth and pretty and nice. He doesn't look like James. And I think that your some of that difference comes from just like the length of the levers and how it looks when you have longer levers. Yeah, it's interesting that people of such different body types can, can be end up in the same spot and be just as competitive with each other. Like for a smaller guy, you have a lower center of gravity. For downhill a lot, like the tracks are so steep now that being smaller, you're lighter, so you can stop quicker. You can break later in the turn and get down to the same, like whatever the maximum speed is for that turn, you can come into it faster and then get down to that speed later. Mm. And I think that's a help now with the way that the tracks are going. You don't have as many tracks like back in the day where you see Minar or PD just mashing the pedals and so strong. It's not really as common on the circuit anymore. Um, but, yeah, it's interesting, too. Like, mountain bikes, you can get in so many different sizes. So there's, mm -hmm. like, a small to an XL, whereas a motocross bike comes in one size. And a lot of times I think that those mountain bikes are optimal in one of the sizes. Maybe not across all of them. They don't scale proportionally. Yeah. And I think that might be part of the reason why the motorcycles don't want to change frames. Like, you don't 
go to the motorcycle dealer and like, oh, I want a size medium Honda 450. And <laughs> yeah. The bike's designed to work as a package the, the way that it is. And you can do small things. The pros can do stuff and stuff to make the bike fit them. But um, it, it's mainly that it works together as a package. And probably that bike works differently for different people. Yeah, yeah. And so what what's your take on the advantages and disadvantage of, of having longer levers in moto? Um, I'd say it definitely helps uh, helps him when he needs to absorb obstacles. Like obviously when he's going through the whoops, he can be able to, you know, move the way that he needs to a little better. Um, and going through the rhythm lanes too, I'd say he can use his body to have more absorption. And, and um, you look at those guys in moto, there's a lot more of like resisting um, – like a, a landing, like they're controlling the mm. deceleration way more than like push. Like they have a bike that gives them all the power they need. They don't need to like produce the power like you would on a bicycle. So using those longer levers, he has more room to like decelerate all the impacts. Yeah, which um, maybe it is an advantage. Yeah, but then I'm sure the smaller guys have somewhat of an advantage too. Being light helps them probably get a better start. Maybe not as much in the 450 class. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm not as much of a moto technique guy, so I don't want to talk too much. No, about no, it's just, it's interesting perspective though, because you're coming at it from a different place, you know? And I think like Honda said that when they had their downhill program, that it was, you know, a lot of research and development for motocross. And because I think that, yeah, there's so, it's so much easier to make geometry and frame changes on a downhill bike than a full perimeter alloy <laughs> motorcycle yeah. frame, you know. So I think that there is like a fair bit of crossover. And I feel like watching Jet nowadays too, like he actually is pumping in turns in the same way that you do on a mountain bike. And I think it might not be for power as much as it is traction because mm -hmm. I feel like you affect, you affect the traction uh, of the motorcycle as well. Like especially he's kind of doing it like mid-turn where you're not really on the throttle yet. So it's like maybe he's like trying to generate a little bit more momentum or maybe it purely is just traction. But yeah, I, th I think like you're sort of slowly seeing a, like more crossover between the two sports in a way. Yeah, I would guess the more momentum they can carry, like the easier the bike is to ride. Like anytime you have to decelerate or accelerate hard, that wears you out. And the bike probably doesn't work as well as it would if it's more neutral. So being able to carry that momentum allows him to be as consistent as he is. Yeah, yeah. So we'll go back to the frameworks side of things. So when did you, the project officially start? And now you're selling frames, but in the early days, I'm assuming it wasn't really about that. It was just you had this desire to make your own bike. Yeah, not at all had any like long-term plan. I just kind of tried to do the best I could in every step of the way. And this is where, where I am at this moment. Um, I got the first frame in the fall of 2021. I had designed it through that year. I um, talked to a few places who could make it for me. Um, Frank the Welder seemed like it was the best option. He's uh, just an old school East Coast dude, um, used to race downhill himself, has made a bunch of downhill bikes. There are custom frame builders out there, but not that many that have experience making suspension bikes and mm. very few that have experience making downhill bikes. So he seemed like the guy, and he actually remembered me when I called him. That's He's so like, sick. I remember you were a kid and used to race at Platic Hill, which is like a local spot in New York, and he used to race there too on some of the bikes that he would make. So that seemed like the right route to go. It was just a fit. And um, anyway, sent him over some designs that I actually did all myself. They were like 2D designs. And I didn't realize how hard it would be to take like a 2D concept and put it in 3D. Ah. Like that's way harder to get like clearances for all the components, um, clearances for the shock, make the stiffness of the frame and the strength of the straight frame what you want. You can get it to like in 2D have the geometry yep. and like the way that the shock's going to feel. That, that was like an easy start for me. But then I didn't realize how much more it would be to like have a, real bike and that you could actually hop on and ride. So you basically send him like a napkin drawing and then. <laughs> well, it was a little bit like it was specific points and everything, yeah. but it was all 2D and, it, and we had to take that and like figure out how to make that into, 
into a 3D. Yeah, game. so that's basically what he comes back as like, hey, mate, bring me something that's uh, like actual it, it, here. Exactly. And like he could help a little bit with some suggestions. Like he knew which tubes we should choose to start with. That would be strong and that would be the stiffness roughly that we were looking for. And he suggested somebody that could help with some of those 3D modeling things. Um, and it went pretty quick. We, uh, I, like, I think I reached out to him in the middle part of 2021, and by November I had the frame to ride. So um, that that was like when I first reached out to him it was just an idea. So it took some time on my side to like coordinate everything, and then um, yeah, finally got that first frame, and it uh, it wrote. It was such an interesting thing because I was like, this is either going to be shit or it's going to be good. And I wrote it, and it was so much better than I expected. I really? was like, no way. Like, I actually I, – I was not stoked on the the intense that we were riding that year. Like, both Aaron and I were struggling a lot with it. And I was like, well, by the numbers, like, this thing looks good, but I have no idea about, like, the stiffness. There's, like, a lot of little details into making a bike. That sometimes small things can make a bigger difference than you think. And when I first hopped on that first bike that I made, I was blown away. I was like, I could race this thing right now. It's better than the bike I raced all year. And uh, – the biggest thing that I didn't realize from that was I was so close, probably like say that bike was 95% of the bike I have now. I was like, sweet, this thing's going to be so easy, like a couple little things and we'll be ready to go. And that last 5% was way, way, way harder than any of the work that I already did. That's so cool though. So why could a guy who's never made a bike before make a bike that felt better than people that have spent a very long time making bikes. <laughs> I think I just knew what I wanted. Like, yeah, okay. And I knew what I wanted, as I'd said before, like in ride feel, how that equates to numbers. So like we're going to use this size shock and this leverage ratio on the shock. We want this anti-squat, which is the force and acceleration. We want this anti-rise, which is how the bike reacts under braking. Uh, we want this axle path and then this geometry. So it sort of was just a puzzle. Yeah, and in a sense. I thought in the beginning, because I talked to engineers in the past, and been like, well, why, why don't you have that anti-squat and this leverage ratio? Or why don't you have that anti-rise with this axle path? Like pick and choose like you're ordering off a menu. And then when I got into it, I realized they all affect each other, and you make one thing better, and it makes all the rest of the things worse. So you have to like prioritize, try to balance them all, put them in a package that's easy to actually make. You can design something on a computer screen that's going to be a nightmare to make yeah, or it's okay. so complex and the tolerances of manufacturing are outside of the adjustability of that bike. So what you get may not be what you designed. So trying to fit all those goals into a package that you could actually make the bike and it not give you a headache when you went to ride it. And uh, I think just knowing what I wanted and in numbers what that was, I could design it and – that's how I made the bike. It's so crazy, man. It's such a cool process. Like I, I'm, I watched a bunch of the episodes that you guys put out while you were in the process. And I mean, I watched the team intro video as well. And like you can just see how good the bike handles. There was one shot in particular. I don't know who was on the bike, but it was just a bike came riding into frame and you could just see it squatting under braking while there was like chop on both ends of the suspension and the thing just looked so nice so it's just it's crazy the journey that you've gone on to make something that it, it really just looks like a great bike yeah and it's it's nothing out of like we're not starting with a new concept like we're we're i didn't look at it to make something different or reinvent the wheel i just tried to take reliable things that were proven to work and make them better. And I think that's what we're saying. That's what that's probably why you don't see a lot of drastic changes with motorcycles now. Yeah. And I yeah, I wish we did that more in mountain biking. Yeah, and it's it's interesting to be a guy that doesn't have constraints. You know, so there's no there's no marketing team to appease. There's no sales quotas to meet. There's no, oh, well, we've already signed this deal with this company and it lasts two more years. Like there's so many layers of complexity that get added on just to make it like a, a business and to be a, a sales-based model. So you've essentially kind of just shown what you can do when you don't have any of that. 
Yeah, the, just the sense of freedom with that is so refreshing. Um, we could use what components I, I genuinely thought were best. Like times when I had raced on Aaron's teams, like he, he pretty much called all the shots for the components and for good reason. I mean, he was winning all the championships. It was his team. But we'd use parts that I wasn't really that stoked with and I wasn't getting paid any more or less because we used tires that were paying a big bill. But, um, you know, if I was the one that could make the decision like, oh, well, that 200 grand would really help a lot with the team and that'll get us further than using the best tires. If I was the one benefiting from that and making the decision, then it would be one thing. But just being a rider on it, it was frustrating at times. And, uh, and now being able to call all the shots and, and test everything and choose what components are the best, um, it's just a really sense of freedom that I enjoy. Yeah, and it's funny, though, like every business, I was just listening to a thing with, you know, Marquez Brownlee? The, no, he's like he's just a con YouTube guy. He does like tech reviews and stuff, but he has an epic YouTube channel. And he was talking this morning about like I guess creator burnout and like there's all these guys that are like retiring from YouTube and shit. And he he used a really great analogy of when you're in business or when you're in like a you're a content creator, you're almost like a an athlete. It's like you spend so long. To, to be a professional athlete, you have to spend so long not being a professional athlete <laughs> and you spend so much time just doing reps after reps after reps after reps. Like Mick Hanna doing 40 runs in a day when you're not getting paid, no one's watching you. It's just you trying to make these incremental gains, you know. But then you get to a point where, oh, you are a professional athlete and you are getting paid it sort of doesn't change as much for a professional athlete and that's where the analogy kind of breaks down. But when you're in, when you're like a content creator or you're making a business, like, so you have this creative pursuit of making a, the best frame possible, but then to turn it into a brand, you then get hit with all of these other things that you then have to deal with that essentially start to strip away like the creative process. So it's like you you can see why those things happen and you can see why you'll use a different tire brand and you'll use it. But it does, you just have to know that it does strip away like the actual product, what you intended, you know, to set out to do initially. Totally. And um, this year we, we offered our frames for sale and kind of learning a lot about how, yeah. how that sort of goes. And it was never a goal of mine to sell the frames. I wanted, in the beginning, I just wanted to make the best bike I could just to, like, I could have stopped that first day when I rode it, and I was like, sweet, this thing's awesome. But I wanted to keep making it better. Like, when I did ride, I was like, this is way better than I expected, but if I just do this, this, and this, it'll be even better. And chasing those every time was what drove me forward. But then actually putting it into production for sale, it's just so many other things. Like, everything that goes along with it from having insurance to sell the bikes, um, being able to actually take the payments, deliver on time, um, working with all the customers who then, like, they, you couldn't do without them. They they trust you and they want to support you, but then they also, they take your time and you have to answer questions and you have to you just have a responsibility to them. So it's a whole other thing. And manufacturing, too, is something that I am learning a lot about. I really thought that... Uh, you'd agree on the price and the lead time and then they would send it when it was ready. But there's <laughs> way more as anybody's probably laughing that there was anything yeah. about manufacturing. There's a lot, probably 200 emails in between there. So um, yeah, there's just a big process between doing something um, for passion and then actually making a business of it. Yeah, and it, it's something that I think it's so hard to like prepare for. Or, and you can try as much as you want to not i guess like to, to not have it interrupt your creative process but it's just like literally impossible you, you, know? you just have to dive in and and just do the best you can every every step of the way you just gotta handle it the best way you can and that's the only way to learn so when did you think okay i'll go from this is just for me to this could be for a lot of people so many people asked me about it yeah so many people said the bike looks awesome i love like everything you said in your video. Like I, I got a lot of support from just recording a video of talking about my bike. Like 
hey, here's the bike I designed. Here's all the things that I did. Here's how it worked. Like, here's why I chose this and here's how it felt. And just making a 10 minute video explaining that, I, I, there's way more people interested than I thought there were. And so many people have reached out about like, dude, I would love to ride one of those. I'd love to buy one of those. And I was running my whole racing effort with all co-sponsors. So it'd be like running Santa Cruz Syndicate without Santa Cruz. You can get a lot more budget. Like all the teams, the big teams are paid for by the bike company that supports them. Yeah. So for me, if I could sell a few frames, that would afford me to be able to continue the project further, just the income from it. Like people want them. I'm selling it to them at a fair price. They're getting a product in exchange for their money. It's not a free handout. They're stoked. I'm stoked. I get more funding to be able to keep doing cool stuff. And it just seemed like it was going to be something that made sense. Like, I don't want to say the easiest way to get more income, but it was something with all the effort that I did. It was a way to do something positive for all the people who wanted to buy one. And at the, I'd done all the work to get there. So it was something if I could put in production would help me out a lot. And what's the visions now? Like, well, how many frames are you guys up to? Like, so I think we sold about 50 so far, like That's between so 45 sick. and 50. Like even just the, the, my brother drove over with me this morning. He's like, oh, somebody bought one this morning. Like we we made 10 extra than than what we took pre-orders for. So we didn't take too much risk. Like that was the biggest thing right now. There's so many bike in, people in the bike industry that have so much product and the, the lead time to make it, like even at a quick rate is like 90 days. And with that time, the market can change a lot. And I think that's how a lot of people got stuck is they just keep making as they were selling it. And then at a certain point, everybody had one. Mm. And by the time the orders came that they placed, the demand went way down. So you have a lot of people right now sitting on a ton of inventory. And I didn't want to take any of this. So I was like, we'll just set up pre-orders. I'm sure I could sell more if I told the customers, I'll ship it tomorrow if you pay for it. There's less people that are willing to give a deposit and then wait 90 days for their frame. But it was a way that I could do it without taking the risk or getting a loan. Their their deposit covered our manufacturing. And if we only sold 50, then that's way better than figuring out a way to buy more than I could sell. And then when they come, figuring out a way to sell them all. Yeah. So that was like a good step into it. And I guess long term, the vision is like, it's just me and my brother doing everything. Like my brother makes all of our videos. He doesn't consider himself a videographer like he's really good though he's gotten a lot like if you watch them as they go yeah. each one's better than yeah. the last one and uh yeah we just bought a camera during covid and watched some youtube tutorials like how do we okay first step how do you turn this thing on and you watch the video before you post it and you can tell if it's good or not and if it's not you just keep changing it yep. and, oh let's go out again and let's refilm it until you're happy with it and that's kind of the way that we've gotten there so far but he's also helping so much on the business side. Like he created the website. He did set up the Shopify stuff. He got the insurance, the owner's manuals, the cardboard boxes to put the frames in, the shipping account. He deals with DHL. Like everything um, is him. So if the two of us can continue to grow it in a way that doesn't have a lot more people involved, like yeah. I'm sure you know, like the less people involved in a lot of stuff, the more enjoyable it normally is. So if we can keep it to a small group like us and – yeah, we sold 50 frames this year in just a downhill frame. If we can get to like maybe 200 or 300 frames, it wouldn't change a whole lot about our process. Like yeah. We just order all the pieces. Like this time we ordered enough to make 50. Like just put in the purchase order enough to make 100 next time, 200 the next time, and um, grow in a in a way that we can keep offering a really good product and like the performance is the driving factor but not try to be too greedy and get so big. Like if we can do it to where we have a lot of time to keep improving the bikes yeah. and test riding yeah. and like doing all the stuff that we love to do. Like right now we're in like growing stage where it is stressful and we're trying to like get over the hump. But once we do just like, cool, we're, we're we don't need to try to keep, you know, full throttle forward, like with performance. Yes. But with sales no. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a, such a trap i think when you have any success in anything it's so hard not to think like oh i could be the best in the world at this or like we could do this 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 and this and it's it's a trap like honestly that a lot of people can fall into with with racing though like the best is like a clear criteria but with business or other things it's like how do you define the best and maybe the best is like each one of your things you do being 
really, really high quality and that you are proud of and not more and not having the most views or the most sales. It's like there's a difference there and the, the criteria can be different for everyone. Yeah, and the, the, I think people get so defined by what is conventional success. You know, like it's funny. I was um, I was doing some research like for for this, and uh, and I was on Vital, and then I, I saw like a Gypsy Tales thing. Now, I never really look at any stuff like that. And there was like there was good comments, and then there was bad comments, and then the bad comments are, are so based off like other people's ideas of success in a way. And I'm like, I was like, okay, I kind of get that criticism if you think that I'm trying to be X, Y, Z. And it's like, I'll tell you what I'm actually trying to be. I'm trying to be a dude that enjoys his life and has a job that he enjoys and that pays well and it like lets me live a lifestyle that I want to live. Like I'm going riding this weekend. You know, I'm not, I don't give a fuck about being this guy or this guy. I don't care if Spotify buys my podcast for $60 million or <laughs> right. Like that's not the actual goal here. And I think that, yeah, a lot of times people like a bike company success then is like, okay, well, who sells the most bikes? All right, specialized. So that's, that's success. That's what you're up against, buddy. And it's like, is it though? Like everyone, we're all running our own race. And if you're like, okay to admit the race that you're in and the race that you're trying to win, then it's like, it becomes pretty easy. Yeah, for sure. And I think like to take the specialized example, they do a great job of, of what they do. And if I wanted to be exactly like them, what, what would the point be of that? Like they're already doing that. So if you have a vision for something that there's space for, that's not being done already, and you can find a small niche there, that's exciting. And that's, I think, what my project is. It's not, I'm not trying to be specialized. I'm trying to be frameworks. And uh, yeah, that's motivating to me. Hey, I'm just going to piss real quick. And yeah. then we'll keep going. I'll, I'll pick up right where we left off. Sounds good. Sounds good. I was wondering how you did this for three hours without <laughs> taking a piss. <laughs> uh, I'm, the, I'm the worst. Dude. I always do this. Yeah, I'm Okay. Can you come in under the table more or does this chair? Yeah, now I can. Yeah, that might be a bit better. Yeah. It's coming up kind of quiet there. Uh, yeah, it might have been a bit further away than you were. Um, what do you, what do you make of, I guess, like just the current economy in mountain biking? Because it's a 
pretty wild time. It seems, I mean, it, the roadmap's pretty clear of like how we got here with it. I mean, they obviously over-ordered based on a kind of a COVID bubble. So you're in a, you're a, you're a bike company now. <laughs> you're in like a unique position because I think a lot of the things that are really hurting these companies, it's just your type of company is not susceptible to those things. Yeah, I think it's different for us. Like I'd say beginner entry level sales are are down big time. But yeah. people who people who ride every day, they're gonna ride every day no matter what the economy mm. does. Like if you're a diehard mountain biker at the core, yeah, it doesn't matter what the world's doing. You're gonna you love biking more than any of that stuff. And I think that for our company, like people don't oh, should I buy a giant or should I buy a frameworks? Like they 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 follow us and and they would buy that bike the first day it came out for sale, whether no matter what the world was doing. So, in some ways, it actually was super helpful. Like I was able to start the the whole team and like got support for myself going racing in 2022 when sponsorship dollars were way easier to get. I don't know if you experienced the same thing, but mm. back then there was like way more sponsorship dollars going around than there are this year. Like marketing budgets are cut big time, and a lot of times racing or sponsorships are like some of the first things that get reduced. So I got the support to even do the project back then when when times were good. And then when other companies kind of cut, cut back on their manufacturing, I could with our, uh, like our we use a carbon fiber rear triangle. Yeah. And I don't think I could have got into that factory with a low minimum order quantity if, uh. if, if there was specialized knocking on the door, hey, can you make me 10,000 bikes? Like they probably wouldn't take my order for 50 chain stays. Yeah. So um at the time, like right now, it's easier to work, to get in over there, and like the factories, they need people to order things. They're they're looking to do manufacturing, so um, it helped in a lot of ways. And for some of the pieces that we need to make, even domestically, like a lot of stuff is um, manufacturing is down, and there's uh, people want to work with you. You can make a deal yeah. right right now because of that. So yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't really thought of thought about that. That it kind of leaves are opening that otherwise wouldn't be there yeah somewhat rising from ashes i guess yeah and i think just the fact that you can be so nimble and you can make changes like people you're the company that you're trying to make isn't aimed at so like a friend of mine his kids are riding mountain bikes and all the kid wants is a santa cruz v10 and it's like that's a great bike but the kid doesn't give a fuck that it's a great bike. He just wants the Santa Cruz V10. And you're not playing in that market. And so I guess Santa Cruz needs to make a bike that looks dope, that appeals to the 10-year-old kid or the 14 or however old he is that wants to buy a Santa Cruz because it's a Santa Cruz V10. So you just don't have to play those games, which yeah. has to be such a refreshing like way to build a company in a sense. Yeah, totally. I mean, there's a ton of good looking bikes out there and you have a ton of options for that. Uh, our bike also uses a pretty long chain stay, which makes it stable at high speeds. And I get a lot of people that ask like, oh, will you make it with a, <clears throat> a shorter chain stay? I'm like, no, <laughs> if you want to buy one of those, like there's a ton of choices. Yeah. If you want a nice looking bike, there's a ton of choices. If you want a purebred race bike, that's the same as the guys racing at the top. There's not very many to choose from. Yeah, and that gives us a small niche, and we don't need to sell. We could sell one one hundredth the bikes of Santa Cruz, and with just me and Logan, be actually probably a better power to weight ratio. Yeah, 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 and actually be profitable based on a lot of different factors. Yeah, I mean, we have we have no debt. We made as many frames as people wanted. They put down a deposit, and we delivered their frame. So it's just a different model, and I think there's space for it with something unique yeah how close are the bikes at the top like you'd say the factory bikes to what people are buying on a showroom floor some of them are pretty close like i bet jackson's v10 is pretty is probably the same frame yeah um i know greg probably tweaked his more than anybody else um like obviously the bikes that loic's riding are totally different and i'm sure that's going to go into some of the yeah. future design but um, it, it just depends on which team it is. Some some riders are more picky than others. Yeah. And it seems like last year's season as well, 
the there was like with the Athens and the way that they made their bike, it seems like manufacturing has kind of come a long way in terms of how much you can do with how little yeah. as well, which seems like a massive advantage. Absolutely. I really like the way the Athertons make their bikes. We're going to work on a bonded version of our frame this season too. Yeah. Um, with welding, there's so many things that could go wrong. Like that was one thing I learned through the whole process was like you can design the bike the best you can, but when it gets to a 1,000 degrees under welding, everything moves and it may mm. not be – you know, uh, luckily ours were pretty accurate and we could get everything like the bearing tolerances back to where they should be. But you're, you're, you're basically taking a round circle at your head tube, heating it when you weld all the tubes around it and it becomes an oval and you try to get it back to <laughs> a circle. So, cool. so there's like a lot of challenges there and there's a, a lot of human element that goes into it as well. Whereas those bonded frames, like they're glued together at room temperature pretty much. So once it's all like press fit and glued, it just dries and it has to be perfect. Um, and the difference between that and a composite frame, like a carbon fiber frame, would be there's way more tooling involved in a carbon fiber frame. Like yeah. a mold f for a front triangle in carbon fiber is probably sixty to $80,000. Yeah. And then, and then you're stuck. Y well, if you want to spend the money again, you can change it. But uh, that's kind of been the death of development for a lot of mountain bike stuff is carbon fiber molds are so expensive that you have to stick with them for three or four years to get your return on it. So yeah. now with this new manufacturing like Atherton, like Pivot's doing, like Bernard was racing a bonded frame as well. Yeah. Like they can, yeah, sure, the CNC pieces are expensive themselves for that one frame, but you don't have to pay for any tooling costs. Yeah. So there's not a lot of like setup to do it. You can just build that frame. It's pretty accurate. It's super accurate. It's strong. It's easy to make. So I think it's definitely like kind of an old thing. Like you see like older road bikes were bonded together. And now it's coming back and being used again, which is pretty cool. Yeah, and it makes the prototyping process so much easier as well. Like you could just make iterations so much quicker than what you could in the past. Yeah, it's really fast to do. Um, most of them, like Bernard's uses a, a form-shaped tube, so it's not a, a round tube. But like Loic's bike uses a round tube, the Atherton uses a round tube, the, tu the bikes that we're using are going to use round tubes. They're really easy to predict. So for engineering, like predicting the stiffness, it's like really easy math to do when you want to use like your tube wall thickness and diameter. And then you can make all the pieces CNC, they show up perfectly and then you glue it together and you're ready to go. Whereas like with welded frames, like someone has to physically weld the whole thing together, then heat treat it then ream all the bearings after. So there's like a, a longer process involved in that. And then with carbon fiber prototyping, they have to make a mold first before they can make mm. the frame. So by this process of doing like a, a bonded frame, like you said, it's way faster. You can change stuff without costs sunk into tooling and the frames are really accurate. And it's almost like a new style. And it's probably gonna it's probably gonna go in vogue too to where people want to have this raw look to, you know, it's, I remember when the carbon stuff came out, it was just everyone wanted carbon frames. It just looked so, it was so F1. It was so um, desirable, you know, but it almost seems like you go so far on the pendulum on this like super sexy carbon fiber to where it's sort of the pendulum swings the other way and it's like raw mix of components looks like an unfinished prototype and it's like i mean the bike loik was on or the atherton you're like that's sick you know like just even the trends change so much in terms of like what people want at the time yeah and their perception of what's sick is almost what's different like if, if it was the other way around you might think the other bike was sick but uh no it just for me it just makes a lot of sense and so how much better can you make your bike from like the production bike that's out now? What's the, like, do the, the wheels just keep turning? Because it's a process that's never going to be done. Like you have to, you obviously have to put bikes out for sale. It stops along there, but is it this constant thing that you're thinking of? Yeah. I mean, it truly is a never ending process. Like I've heard somebody say that when you put a production bike out, it's just stopping your development process at one point in time yeah. like it never it keeps going but that's the point where like okay this is the one that's out for sale um so i mean to make it better i would have to know things that i don't know today and yeah. it's really testing that gets you there like so far my process was make one bike 
write it like long enough to take every note that I could. Because you can write it the first day and for sure I can pick five things that I would change on the first hour of writing it. But then you have to live with it for a while to really mm. know and then put all as much as you can into the next version. Because if you order the next version too quickly and learn a couple more things, you're like, oh, shoot, I wish I would have put that into the last one. Like I didn't live with it long enough to know everything that needed to be improved. So that's been my process so far was just live with it for as long as I can and still meet the timeline of like getting the next bike ready for the next race and improve it every time. I think we went through like nine or ten versions of that. But it was always just like, take notes, what can we do better? Take notes, what can we do better? So now, really, I think it's as good as it can be with that process. We have to almost go back to the drawing board again of like, all right, let's try some high pivot bikes again. Let's try some mm. different braking forces. Let's try some s stuff that instead of just making these marginal gains. like Yeah, let's just step out of the box. Let's play in a new box and then see what exactly. we can do. Exactly. Yeah. And try to isolate one variable at a time. So not change like... 10 things and see how that worked. But just like try to keep as many constants as possible and isolate one thing and see if you can find a trend with that one thing that you like. And if I can do that on a couple of different of the aspects of my bike, I think I can learn how to make it better in the future. Yeah. But it's a back to the drawing board sort of thing. Yeah. So let's go to you get frame number one. Between frame number one and frame number two, how many hours of riding do you think you did? Hours of riding is hard on a downhill bike. Because um, like I said, in a day you might do 20 or 30 minutes. Yeah. But I would say probably 30 days of riding. So maybe that that equates to 15 hours Yeah, roughly. Um, and, and all this on a pretty tight timeline to try to like get every, all that knowledge down on paper and make the next one quick because when you start to learn this stuff, like the next one can't come quick enough. Yeah. And there's normally like, a, say, eight to 10 weeks of like, okay, here's everything. Now I have to wait for it to show up. Yeah. And the worst is when, like, during that period, you're, you're riding the old bike and, and you learn something else and you're like, fuck, I wish I'd put that into the design. <laughs> yeah. So you got to, like, like I said, keep it long enough to where you don't have that happen. And so, what's the process that you're going through? Because so the, the first time that you got the frame, did you have a workflow that you would use? So like I will use the podcast, for example, like like I was saying when you come in, like we've got this new setup and we're doing all this new shit and it's like I would be explaining it to people as like, well, it probably won't look much better. It's not going to sound that much better. Like it already looks good. It already sounds good. So it's like we're making gains in different places. So – this audio that gets recorded is already basically like mixed and the effects are in there, the, the processing's in there, then everything's in a template that's been built now. So once you drop the files in, it actually puts like the final mix on it and then that gets attached to the camera footage automatically. Like there's just every step like top down from sitting here recording the podcast to it going into the computer to it going onto a server to it going onto the internet going to the editors, getting back to here, going like, like there's just this huge process that over six years of doing this, it's like this one, I guess it's the same in a sense where it's like a frame where, all right, this is the setup, this is what we're doing and we'll do 30 or 40, 50 podcasts with it. And then it's like, all right, we're going to tweak it. And now we'll do another 30 or 40 podcasts with it. But, and then you get to like now where we've done a fairly big setup change, I guess you could say. So, <laughs> but nowadays I know like I have these are the boxes that need to get ticked. This is what I'm chasing out of the setup. So, did you have like frame one, process one, and then it's like the frames changing, but your process for testing and gathering data also changes? So it's like you're not just iterating the frame, but also the process of iteration gets iterated essentially. Yeah, I, it's it's pretty similar, dude. It's funny. I, I can really appreciate that. Um, I think I showed the bike to my uncle, like the final bike, and he's not really that into it. And he was like, oh, it looks the same as the first bike. <laughs> so <laughs> somebody who doesn't know, it, does, yeah, it does look the same. But there's so much little details that go into it. I'd say when we started, we we weren't as apt in the data recording. Like we we had the system. I knew I've done it before, but I wasn't basing all of my feel or like trusting as much in those data 
recording numbers. So a lot of it was off of feel. And I think it was a good way to get there that way is like learn the feel, get the bike, you know, 98% of the way there off of feel. And then going back and recording data and comparing that with data rather than the other way around. So yeah, the first couple of them, I uh, I just rode them. I would ride them as much as I could. I even let other guys ride them. Probably some other World Cup guys that I would, shouldn't say. They're like, yo, can I hop on that thing? Let's <laughs> yeah. let's let's switch bikes. And um, it's cool to get other people's opinion on it too. Um, but ultimately, like I trusted in in my own ride feel. In the beginning, like it's. It's way better to do comparisons. So if you have two things yeah. that you can compare back to back, yeah. then you can get pretty quick feedback on like which one was better, which way you want to go. And in the beginning, I made two bikes actually. I made a high pivot version with an idler pulley, and then I made my standard version. And I rode them both back to back, did a bunch of timed runs, like the clock speech for itself. Yeah. And then also like your feeling, how easy it was to get that time. To get that speed, yeah. Um, so that's how I started was with those two frames took all the feedback of like which one I preferred where, there was a difference between them and I could use that information to decide which direction to go. And so are you doing full runs? Are you doing sections? Like what would the split be of that? Uh, I normally pick a track that's like a minute and a half to two minutes long, something that's not so long that I can't be consistent. Yeah. So like the biggest thing is you need to be riding exactly the same every time. Okay. So like my track at Rock Creek, which is the bike park that I built, is about two minutes long. So I do full runs there. It's quick to shuttle. It's easy to repeat. Um, it's hard when you test ride because like even something like eating lunch in between can totally change the way that you feel and hard to be this, like you're not the a robot. Guy, yeah. Um, so like trying to control as many variables as possible. That's something you get better at when you test ride more is to like take that stuff out of it, plan your test riding. I did a lot of back to back. So I'd like do two runs on this bike and many of them, I changed all the components, which is really nice on my bike. Like everything's external, all the brakes and everything. So I was getting pretty fast. Like I could do a frame swap in 20 minutes. And I would just take like the fork, leave the front wheel on, leave the brake on, rip the whole thing out, put it on the other bike. Uh, same shock, same back wheel. Like I think I literally had like cranks through, headset and crowns through, like stuff that's just hard parts that yeah, don't change. Yeah. But even down to like if the brakes feel different, you might have a different experience whether you consciously do or not, with one bike or the other. So I would I would go two runs on this bike, two runs on that bike, two runs on this bike, two runs on that bike, and make sure at least twice I went back to back because a lot of times the last thing you ride is the best. Yeah. Like where you get yeah. to a point where you get tired and like the thing you rode before you got tired was the best. And it's like the only correlation I see here is that you got better until you got tired yeah. it wasn't anything to do with the parts so by going back and forth like if you just go to something new normally you'll like it. you have to go back to the base once you go through all your testing go back to the base to compare where you started from and a lot of times the first time you make the change you're like wow this is huge and then you go back to what you started with and you're like oh it's not that big as i thought it was the first time and and you're using the lap times or like the well i guess you call them lap times to confirm everything every time basically yeah i, I wouldn't say it's the end all be all um but it's definitely that's that's the goal is to be faster if something's like way sketchier to ride but you can have got one fast lap on it it might not be the best route to go but you try to get a correlation between that stuff and then if you're testing two things back to back it's like okay this is all the information we have like is there something that could be in between this that we don't have today that might give you like this attribute that you liked on this mm. thing, but not give up the things that you liked on the other thing. Yeah. And and so you get the the first, so you had a base setting that basically never changed or would you change the base setting from like day to day and then for your back-to-back -back bike? Um, I, I really wouldn't change too much. I was trying to just have the variable be the bike. Yeah. So with those two, I had the high pivot and the, and the standard bike, and I was trying to keep as many things consistent as I could. Yeah. So the difference would be the bike. Yeah, okay. And then so then you get frame number two, and then what changes in your process? Like what did you learn in the process of testing frame number one that then you – learning frame number two and it's like that workflow kind of vibe where it's like okay we got to do this 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 and this like do you end up being able to test quicker and get through the process quicker and more accurately 
I definitely can do it quicker, but like I said, you don't want to fall in the trap of like riding at one time and making every change just because of the lead time it takes to make a bicycle. You want to try to get enough time on it to really live with it, find things that you might not know on the first day. Go race it. Like yeah. you can test it all you want, but until you take it to a race, that's when you really learn. I think you probably appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And and I guess like what would you find at races? It's just going harder, deeper. Like The tracks are just different. Like it's hard yeah. to get. Like at some of the World Cups now, there's 300 riders on the track and they're all like all those guys know what the good line is. So they're on that line breaking hard time. and yeah. that line gets rough. Yeah. And there's, uh, there's shit in the track. There's breaking bumps. There's ruts that get blown out. Like, it's really hard to get a practice track that's the same as a yeah. racetrack. Yeah. So getting on a racetrack, getting in those conditions, um, you as a rider, when you have those nerves going on, like just putting it through that whole weekend of racing, you learn so much more. And so when you said that the bike was pretty sweet straight away, but the last 5% was so hard to get, what were you chasing in the last 5%? I'd say it was just some minor changes with the actual ride feel of the bike. Um, like, uh, we can make the chain stay five mil longer. That'll give it a little more stability. We can make it less progressive, which will give it more support in the beginning of the travel. Um, we can make the main pivot a little bit higher, which will give it more rearward axle path. So when you're at sag, the bike's not growing or shrinking at all. Like your rear center is more predictable. Very small things, stuff that didn't change a lot. It was more how to make the bike um, more durable and the, the total stiffness of the bike, the weight of the bike. It was like in just a 2D form, really good. But then our, our unsprung mass, which is all the parts that move with the suspension, is heavy relative yeah. to our sprung mass. So we went to the carbon fiber rear end for that. Um, the stiffness of the bike was pretty stiff in the beginning. So we went to a link that had the bridge in front of the seat step, in front of the seat tube instead of behind. So taking yeah, that link and yeah, moving yeah. it allowed the yeah. rear end to flex in a different way. Um, choosing tubing that was stronger um, in certain directions without adding a, ter- a, a ton of stiffness to the bike um, and making the whole bike more repeatable to make. Like fabricating these things like handmade bikes, there's always little differences between them. And the more I could get those processes out like we used to use a bent down tube so frank would bend the tube in his shop and then he would miter all the tubes now we use all straight tubes the tubes are stronger when they're straight yeah there's and more consistency thing. and they're actually cut at a laser cut place now so we send them a 3d model of the tube and the miters are all cut with a laser so he pretty much gets an assembly of pieces to make a bike and just all he has to do is lay welds and that makes it a lot more consistent for him to do. He's really good at laying welds. He's not as good as a laser is at cutting miters and tubes. Yeah. So as I went, it was just like, how can we design the bike in a process? Just like your podcast. Like yeah. nobody listening to it probably knows that this was way easier for you to make and more repeatable. And you can do a better job because you're spending less time on those things. But the thing works the same and it's way better process to do it. Oh, yeah. And it gets back to what we were saying before about that creativity. You know, like there's been times doing this where I spend so much time on like the production or post-production of the show that the next podcast is booked and you haven't done any research, you haven't done any, like you're stressed, you're working like right up until the point of the next person sitting down and you're just like, this is not good for the product of like what, the product is that I'm actually putting forward. So it's like all of those, and that's where I think like the saying love is in the details. Like I think that's where it comes in because it's like you've got to do all of these like weird invisible things right and like that's what takes love and time and attention is like the things that most people wouldn't even look at. It's like that's where you have to spend so much time to actually make your product good. Yeah, it's it's the bottom of the pyramid, right? You got to lay the the framework for success. 
Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't, uh, no pun intended. Uh, that's awesome. Um, so then you've got frame two and then to go to nine, like how, what's changing in those periods of time? It, or is it even like not necessarily changing the bike and the geometry, but it's like durability. It's like, is it those types of things? Yeah, it was less things every time, as you can imagine. Yeah. Um, no, The first couple, there was big changes, like things you could actually notice when you look at it. And then it went to just, yeah, making it easier, to more repeatable to make, putting more complexity into CNC parts and less into like actually building the frame by hand. Um, we tried some steel frames along the way, which was interesting, change in material, um, different tubes as well in aluminum, and ultimately like landing on the final frame, which was not a whole lot different, but a lot more repeatable, a lot nicer of a finished product, a lot stronger as well. Um, we also recorded some data, not on suspension, but on forces that go through the bike with Faction Bike Studios, like an engineering company in Quebec. And they reached out to me about if I could do, if they could help me with something in exchange for marketing. Like they normally work with big companies that they do engineering for and they can't talk about because it's a, it's like a B2B service. Yeah. But they wanted to market their service. And they're like, actually, dude, like anybody at these companies that would be interested in our service are probably watching your videos. Cause like <laughs> yeah. if they're an engineer, they think this is cool. Yeah. So is there anything we can do for you for free? Um, and in exchange, you explain Just it on tell one of your videos. That was us, yeah. Yeah. Um, so they recorded all these forces in the frame. We went to the Bromont World Cup track and went to Mount St. Anne during the race and they put these uh strain gauges like all over my frame and could measure Are they like, like little metal pieces that get stuck onto the frame yeah yeah okay and they have um yeah they can measure like how much str it's the same as like what a power meter would be mm -hmm. um they just measure like force and at bottom out of the bike or in a turn or wherever it is through the travel they can measure like how much load goes through that whole frame and that was pretty interesting because we didn't have that information before. I would never have that on my own. And for them to be able to record that, we could look at exactly where all the forces are going through the bike and be like, your, your bike's actually like overbuilt in a lot of areas. Yeah. You could make it lighter, but there's like a few key areas that you can make it stronger. So like if you could just clean this stuff up, you could make it way lighter in these other areas. And having that information was super helpful. It allowed us to like do a couple things at the end that really made the bike way more durable and... Um, lighter as well that's so cool the it's just a sick process like yeah. it it is the dream for anyone that is you know remotely i guess engineering inclined in any or ever daydreamed about making their own bike or doing their own thing and the way that the projects kind of evolved and different people wanting to help out and different people that you met like it's so unique to you and your experiences and the things that you've been through and it's just so cool that it's got to this level right now yeah absolutely it's a i'm so proud to be able to do it like it's everything that i love it represents me perfectly um i think i've gotten so much help within the industry as well like people that work for bike companies that i'm friends with that would help me more because they know me or that they see what i'm doing they see the the passion that i have for it then you would get like it shows that the industry is like a small circle and it's cool that i've gotten the amount of help and support that i have along the way definitely wouldn't have been able to do it without like some friends at other companies helping after work to like give me some crucial advice and i've tried to pay that back too when i could i've like test rode bikes for my buddy kieran who does a lot of test riding for santa cruz like i at one point had the new v10 and a new nomad and he had my enduro bike and my downhill bike <laughs> and it was like well like uh, I don't need to know as much on engineering. As, like you don't need to tell me stuff that I'm not allowed to know, but like I'll ride the bike and tell you exactly what I think of it. And like, I'll give you the bike with all the engineering. So, you know, it's like you riding a test mule that you didn't have to build yourself. It's like open source almost. Yeah. So it's kind of a cool relationship that I've been able to have with people like that. Um, and I know a lot of people in the industry that do, like my friend Kirk McDowell does all the test riding for Norco. He used to race World Cups. And love to talk to him whenever it races. Um, some of the guys that work for Specialized came out to test at my bike park. And I asked if they would be interested in, like, one of the, their test riders, could he ride my bike? And they're like, oh, yeah, absolutely. Like, we'd love him to ride it because then 
it's another data point for us. Like the more bikes he can ride, the better. Like that's just information towards for us. So them being as open with that and um, like they've helped me with questions I've had. Like when I was cracking some of my frames, they make their bike in alloy right now too. And I, I like reached out with some questions. I didn't know what they would be able to do. And they called me for 45 minutes on a Zoom call and like gave me real valuable information. And there's not a lot of big companies that would do that. I think it's really cool that they've all helped me so much. And I think it's like, you can only like specialized for that. You can only like yeah. Santa Cruz for that. Yeah. Like you can only, it's only a positive thing. It's not like their boss is like, why'd you tell Nico that information? Like we got to keep him down so that yeah. we can get up. Like, yeah. There's none of that going on. And I think it's really awesome that they were able to do that. That is epic, man. And then I think as well, like the appreciation from the fans and like just the consumer that wants to, like I'm sure if there's a person that's bought a Frameworks frame, like they feel a part of the company. They feel like they're in at the ground floor and it was consumer or, you know, future potential customers' interest that even led to the bike being produced in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. If all those people wouldn't have asked me like in person when they saw me riding at a race or a bike park or reached out, left a comment on one of our videos or, or one of our posts that said that they wanted to buy one, um, if it wasn't for them, it wouldn't have been something that was on my mind. And yeah, the goal is to like, they were the ones that trusted us from the beginning. So let's deliver them this bike, like in the best possible way we can. And hopefully they tell three of their buddies, dude, you got to buy one of these next time. Like this was the best bike I've ever ridden. Like that's worth so much that, that word of mouth c communication. Oh man, a hundred percent. And so you've got your race team this year, which has kind of stepped up a little bit. So you've got a couple of new riders on the team and you're going to be doing some World Cups, the American series. Yeah, we have a new series in the U.S. now, which is awesome. Yeah. The Monster Energy supports it, the Pro Downhill Series. It's something yeah. we needed for a while. Yeah. The series in the U.S. used to be like each venue or, or regional series would – just call one of their races a national yeah and they just like connect usa cycling would just give points to like these three or four races and there was no consistency between it like the format the timing like everything else like the schedule was just different and now it's all being run as one thing uh clay harper runs it who runs yeah. the u.s open yeah and uh the u.s open is the biggest race we have in the u.s so him taking it on and just going in person to every race and it being the same at every one is going to be huge it's here we only have four races but it's like a really good start the dates are good dates that people that the pros can actually make yeah. a lot of times like usa cycling would schedule the other ones over world cups or just dumb stuff <laughs> it's so insane man. and 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 now it's like a good schedule good races um so that'll be huge and i'll i'll be doing all those our our whole whole team will be and then i'll do as at least the first part of the world cups see how it's going um I plan to like test a lot of these future things. Like we're going to get this bonded frame and factions helping us with it. And they'll test it a bunch in their lab to make sure that it passes all the strength tests before I ride it, which is huge. <laughs> something that we never did, but like I was doing that myself, like cracking them oh. and being like, how can we make it stronger? So them being a real company, it like takes a lot of that away, but I'll still race it at the first two world cups to make sure that it's good before angel and Asa race it. Like, I don't want to give them anything that's unreliable or not even proven to be faster. Like they shouldn't be testing stuff at races. Like yeah. I can be an asset in doing that. And I love doing it too. And they can just focus on ripping and getting good results. And that's what they're the best at. Oh man, it's so cool. And yeah, it's cool to talk about that series. I, I can't remember the dates, but I looked at a couple of them and I was uh, I was talking to Josh Hill because he I think he's going to race in like the AM class. I was like, dude, I should just definitely get a bike and like do one of these races. Dude, but you should. I think I'm going to be away for... He's going to do the one because there's one near you, right? Yeah, that's so I actually built that bike park. And oh, okay, cool. I'm a part owner in it. And Josh comes and rides pretty often. That's what too. he said. He's yeah. such a nice dude. I, I, I saw he, he like reposted when the series yep. was announced. Yep. I was like, dude, if you need a bike, just let me know. And he's like, no way. Like, that would be sick. So <laughs> that would be so yeah, sick. Yeah, hopefully he comes and, and races no matter what. But hopefully I can hook him up with a bike too. Dude, I bet he'd be pumped. Yeah, so I saw him, him share it. And I've I've met Clay before, and he's a super nice guy. And uh, when I saw that, yeah, he posted, I was like, man, that's awesome. I'd love to come and and do it. But I mean, I haven't even I don't even know the last time 
I actually would have rode a downhill bike. But it'd be super fun to just go in the amateur class and just, yeah. just get down the bottom of the hill. But it's pretty sick that there's actually a series being supported and being organized because it blows me away that it hasn't happened sooner. Like the pe- per capita, like the people that ride mountain bikes versus like motocross or something like that is so much more. But the organization, it's always just been so insanely fragmented. Yeah. And and now too, like so many people, uh, amateur riders are going to World Cups to try to qualify. There's no middle ground. S- yeah. Kinda, it's yeah. like you race regionally, you get into mountain biking and there's like no place of value to go that you can sharpen your skills and like get some notoriety without going to a World Cup. So you see a lot of guys, they'll like spend five grand to go to a World Cup in Europe, do five practice runs, not qualify. And what did they get out of that? Literally nothing. <laughs> like they they probably hate mountain biking now. <laughs> yeah. So if we had something in between where, where guys could like, you know, there's people covering the race. They're telling the story about like who's coming up, who's getting faster. That guy who got 60th and, and got cut at the World Cup, maybe he can go there and get on the podium. There's some photos like whoever gave him a free bike is like stoked that yep. he was able to get some publicity that he would never got getting 60th at a World Cup. And then he sharpens his skills too. He gets better. And when he's won a couple of those, and then he goes over to the World Cup. I think it's something that we just are missing. And I think the way that the World Cup's being run is like they're making all these cuts from the top mm. and they without building the, the foundation to, yeah. to be able to do that. Oh, man, 100%. And it, the sport, all sports are built from the ground up, you know, and like you can have a sport, like let's say Supercross right now. You could take Supercross and you could, like the entire sport could only focus their energy on Supercross because that's the thing that's selling right now. And it's like that would work for one cycle of athletes and then you're done. Once all your heroes and once the top level guys in the sport are done, then it goes away. But in motocross, we're lucky that there's this like Loretta Lynn's and there's this crazy series of qualifiers and areas and regionals that you can do it. Like there is just such a clear stepping stone and there's people making money out of that. You know, like I think that's another thing too. It seems, I don't know if it's the same in mountain biking, but it's like a guy like Clay Harper comes along. It's like, oh, he's making all this money off of these. It's like, dude, yes, there, there needs to be people that can put on profitable events, make money, reinvest that money with some leftover to have a car, have a house, feed their family, you know? Like you really need these people in the sport that are willing to like, that they can make money from it and then they can reinvest that. And like that's the cycle. That's the thing that has to happen over years and years and years to like grow a sport to be the top level that it can be, you know? Yeah, and I guarantee you it's not going to be walking away with bags of money on the first <laughs> no. year. Like, I've done a lot of race promotion myself. And um, the, the biggest thing is a value proposition. Like, if if he can offer an experience that somebody can come for those three days, compete in this race, pay their entry fee, and it's a huge value to them, then then everybody's happy. Everybody wins. And then in the end, if the, if the thing looks good enough that Monster wants to come along and support it, then, then they're stoked and and Clay gets more money to produce a better series. So it's like if if he's if he is able to be profitable of it, it's because he did a great job and yeah. and everybody involved is happy. He's not yeah, taking and, money away from the riders. He's he's bringing more opportunity. Oh man, for sure. And I, I say that because like Davy Coombs always, that's like the one thing everyone's like, oh, the Coombs family, they make millions out of Loretta's. And it's like, you been there? You couldn't pay me a million dollars to run that event. Yeah. Like it's a head fuck. It would be a nightmare. Like they build a city in a valley in Tennessee that has no phone reception. Not, like it's absolutely insane what they do. And it's like a person needs to make money out of that <laughs> for it to be a thing that they actually are willing to do. Yeah, and pro- provide a service. Like yeah. the, there needs to be a place for these a kids to go service. race, like to be able to compete in a fair race, in a competition that takes these kids to the next level. Like it's something that needs to be done and you should be happy that they have that, right? Yeah. And uh, how bad do you think that downhill and mountain biking in general has needed a series like this? I think at the moment we need it 
pretty badly because World Cup has had several cuts over the past few years in the amount of riders that qualify, yeah. which I think is needed. Like, yeah. I, I would agree with that too, to be honest. Th- there's too many people, and I would agree that the the TV show could probably be better, and the experience for the top guys can be better with less people. Um, but they've they've made a lot of cuts. Um, this year, we've cut to the semifinal, which you get 60 riders from Quali, which was for the past maybe four or five years. That was 60. It used to be 80 before that. Yeah. And now they cut to 30 after the semifinal, and you only have 30 in the final, which you can imagine for a lot of the guys, like downhill is interesting too because there's there's one series. It's not like there's Supercross and Motocross and MXGP yeah. and 250 and 450. It's like we have one series. So if you imagine like and who's so the, many fast guys. Who's the 20th place guy or even the 10th place guy, and then you add that there's – you know, four series of 10th place, place guys. Yeah. Like in downhill, it's like you've got really good guys in 40th place that are getting cut now. And the times are so close that it, it might even be the 10th place guy that has one mistake and now he's out. So it's pretty stressful for the guys. Like everybody could agree the TV show would be better, but the riders don't want to be the one that's cut. So now that they're making all these cuts, there's no place else for them to go. Um, guys want to go to the World Cup and compete because that's the, the top of the sport. But where do you go if, if, like, there's no series of value, as I said, that is doing that right now? Like, I think Crankworks could be. Um, unfortunately, their dates are a little bit challenging for people to get to them all. I went to the one in Rio last year. The broadcast was amazing. Like, Red Bull did such a good job. They basically took everything that they were doing in the World Cup the last year, and now that they lost the contract to broadcast the World Cup, they put that into Crankworks. They had Rob Warner announcing. Yeah. Like, everything was, like, top notch. But... We didn't get that many riders because because of the dates. I didn't want to go to New Zealand, and then the one in New Zealand and the one in Cairns were like seven weeks apart. So mm, like they need to be like for people in North America or or in the Northern Hemisphere to go down there, it'd be nice if they were close, yeah. so you could take one trip. Yeah, I spent a lot of money on the flight, and I wasn't going to be able to go twice. So um, I think they could probably do something as well. Um, looks like Hardline is trying to put on a series now. They have two races. Yep. I think they want to expand that, which will be really cool. But I think globally we just need to like work together with some sort of system where you have like the World Cup at the top, and then below it you have this, whether it's in each continent. You have like a European series and North American series in Oceania or something. And then below that you have like regional series. So there's a clear path for kids that are coming up that don't just – go to their regional race, won a race, and they're like, okay, let's go to the World Cup and see where we end up. Don't do well because they were there way before they should have been and then get burnt out early. Yeah. Yeah, no, dude, I completely agree. And I think that that exact same thing applies in Supercross right now. Like, I think that it's kind of insane, and I use the analogy of imagine the Nets and the Knicks are playing in Madison Square Garden. And there's a half court game going on two blocks away where five guys will get picked by the coaches of those two teams to sit on the bench for the Knicks and the Nets game in Madison Square Garden. Like that's basically what's happening in a 450 LCQ. And it's like, I don't know that that would fly in basketball. I don't know if that would fly in the NFL. Like, I don't know if that's the right route where it's like dudes that essentially work jobs uh able to play on like the same stage and you can see in the on the bike and you can see them doing their sport they're just not on the same level like not even remotely on the same level and that to me is not a great thing but there's nowhere else for them to go yeah so and that's where and we have this thing called arena cross which is like the perfect stepping stone that no one watches and no one really cares about so it's like why don't we just have the 20 best dudes show up every single weekend in Supercross. You know who's on the gate. It's like the same 20 dudes show up in Formula One. Or, yeah, I think it's 20. Yeah, They show up in Formula One. The same guys in MotoGP. Like that model is a model that works. But it's like that would mean that the best privateers, like the best of the rest, would end up having to get paid drives. Like we need to fill these gates. So who's the best dudes? Okay, you now get a chance. You're on a contract. You're getting paid to ride. You get to ride the best bikes. You get the test tracks. You get access to this, 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 and this. So you'll see like the level of the bottom 
guys rise, which I think adds to the better package. And then if you commit to this, the secondary or like the tiered series and give them the respect that they deserve. And then the, the worst privateers in Supercross would probably be some of the best top level dudes in arena cross. And yeah. it's like, that's how it should work, you know? So I completely agree with what you're saying. And I think that all sports need to kind of follow that model. And you've got it, a clear model in MotoGP. You've got Moto3, you've got Moto2, you've got F3, you've got F2, you've got F1. It's like the model is there. We just need to kind of adopt the model because you're so right. Like the top 30 in downhill, I mean, there's easily, yes, 50 guys that could potentially fill that spot, you know? Yeah, totally. I mean, and to those other series like MotoGP or F1, they have Moto2 and Moto3 and people watch those. Yeah. Like there's, it's a, both a stepping stone and a value yep. to be in there. And that's that's the thing that we're lacking. Yeah, and I think that you look at the in Supercross, the lights class is an awesome example of that. I mean, I'm watching Deegan versus Lawrence in the same <clears throat> the same way that I'm watching Tomac versus Sexton. Like it's great racing with elite level dudes. It doesn't matter to me that they're on a two fifty or a four fifty, but they are there is a distinction in terms of like the series that they're racing. So yeah, I completely agree. And I think that it's a easy, should be like an easy adoption real. Like, you know, I just don't understand the resistance to making something like that happen. I think in mountain biking, at least it requires a lot of people to work together across different countries and continents that sometimes that working together can be harder than it, than it really should be. Who, like, is there a leadership group? Like, who would be the ones that would make it happen? So now it's difficult because the UCI is, like, the governing body of the sport. They're, mm. like, the uh, FIM, but for all cycling. And downhill is interesting because it's pretty different from all other forms of cycling. Like it's not really cycling. Rules for road biking are totally different yeah. for downhill mountain biking. Like, it almost aligns more with, like, a X game sport or yeah. an extreme sport than it does with an Olympic sport. Yeah. So we're, we're governed by them, but now um, the races are run by Warner Brothers Discovery, who took over this or, or last year in 2023, and they pretty much produce all the racing. So they make the calls on where, where we're going, where the venues are, and the UCI just enforces the rules. And how was what was your take on the Discovery takeover this year? Like goods, bads? I think they were up against a big challenge. There was regardless of good or bad, like there was a lot more people racing. The first World Cup this year, we, I think there was 400 downhill entries across men, women, and junior categories. See, that just seems crazy. There, sh- there shouldn't be 400 no. people trying to qualify for a World Cup, but as we said, where else do they go? Yeah. So they have all these people there. We have issues with logistics because of that. There's no time for um, people to get enough practice runs. There's not enough flat space in the venue for people to have pits. So there's a lot of challenges like internally there was a lot of resistance yeah, against them. Yeah, they're fully cooking it. Like I didn't know all that. Yeah, that's crazy. But a lot of it wasn't necessarily their fault. Like yeah. they couldn't control that. I think they said last year is 125 teams and this year is 195 teams registered to be a team. So just Dude, with, no. <laughs> with that many more people, yeah. it's like where, where do you put them? And it was too late to make another cut. It was like, oh, the, regist- the registration date I think is January 15th every year to, to put How your team in. How much does it cost to race? Uh, it's five grand to register a team. And then after that, I think it's around 150 bucks per, per entry. entry. If you're an elite team, you pay more. I think it's 10 or 12. So they're making a fuck ton of entries. Yeah. Well, the, the team registration goes to the UCI. The registration goes to the local organizer. So the venue organizes the race. They get that. And I believe they get the extra pit fees as well. So if I want... I get 30 square meters for free. Well, after I paid five grand. And if I want any more space, that goes to the local organizing committee. But they have to put so much money out to be able to host the race that they're they're not really making money off of this. It's more of a uh, tourism thing. They're bringing people to their region to be able to hopefully make money in the local economy by having this event not only that weekend, but make it look good enough on TV that – you want to go visit Lenzer High to Switzerland because it looks so cool when you watch that race. Yeah. Dude, we're talking about the same thing. Like frame companies, it's just there's economics at play. 
that force your hand. Race yeah. organizers, there's economics at play that force your hand. Like it's just so hard to have pure things. Yeah, <laughs> these it is. days, you know, like. And a lot of people are are against uh, Warner Brothers and the guys running it now, um, and and they have a they have a hard job to do that. I mean, they took on the challenge, um, but I, I kind of want to give them a chance. Like, yeah. I, I don't think the broadcast was any better this year. I think maybe it was worse than what Red Bull did. Red Bull had more data on the screen, they had better announcing for sure, and they had better camera work as well. Um, Warner Brothers can distribute it to more people. I think like. They're, they're able to play it on Eurosport which, and instead of just being uh, streamed on Red Bull TV. So they have more people watching it potentially. I wonder if the numbers did reflect that though. They, they said that they were maybe 10 times the amount of people watching the race this year. Really? But, and, and apparently that's from a, a third party yeah, okay. that, that gives that information. But I don't know. Like it, it's really hard to know, like yeah. to quantify that. It would take a couple of years to really see that yeah and and hopefully like the goal is they do make a more concise tv package that is is better to watch like i i think i watched one of the snowboarding things from the x games and i'm not super into it but like i don't necessarily need to watch the 30th place guy snowboarding that i don't really know so i can see how to like the broader fan that a more concise package is definitely better for tv and hopefully with more tv and more people watch you can get some outside sponsors who don't have a lot of right now it's like bike parts and bike companies are yeah. paying for bike racing it's just like a circle that goes around yeah and if we can get more money from the outside to come in and support this then we can do a better job grow it to be bigger which it used to be like that yeah i mean you look in the brian lopes days like it was all outside sponsors or so every team had a car manufacturer like it was it was a much different time then yeah for sure and I, I don't know. Time will tell if we can get there. Which we're in an interesting time in the bike industry. Like this year, more teams were cut than any other year I can imagine in the past. Like you almost saw, you almost saw every team either cutting or cutting back on their effort for this year. And it's just a direct reflection of sales in the bike industry. So it's kind of tough at this time to say that they're doing an awesome job when like we're we're in a bad spot in the economy as well, and especially in outdoor sports. So hopefully, you know, they can make this TV broadcast better. It is more of a value. Um, my buddy that I mentioned with NASCAR team said that they pretty much just take the TV package and sell that to a sponsor mm. and say, These, this is how many people watch the race. This is where your logo is going to be seen. Here's our statistics as a team. If I could take that to a sponsor, probably a lot easier to get money coming in than right now. We don't really have that information for downhill. Yeah. Okay. So what I like, yeah, you can't even really go to outside industry sponsors and give them I'm metrics not, in that way at all. There, it, it's I'm not using much at all for the broadcast. I'm using like myself and the riders on the team's personal social media accounts yep. as, as our metric and what we can deliver and then some race results as well. But if we can get to a point where we can say, here's the exact watch time of this broadcast and this is how many people watched it crankworks did a really good job of sending us a report of that oh that's they sent us out a report of red bull tv how many people watched and then down to each rider like my run like i i was in the hot seat for a little while and i had my run and it was like eight minutes of watch time during that broadcast watched by x amount of people exactly and and that's the type of information that would be really helpful for us as teams and i believe that we can get to in the future i think they see that value as well and we can get some more sponsors coming in oh man for sure and that's honestly just how it works with this dude like i get hit up by people not as often as i'd like but i mean like a manscaped like they just hit me up like we come up on charts that obviously there's like apis like data scrapers that will figure out how much this gets listened to and then the youtube metrics and then they just literally send me a contract and they say, hey, this is how much we think your show is worth to us. Like, do you want that? And I'll be like, oh, I think it's worth a couple dollars more, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. But it's like it's literally that easy because they have the data. And I can look at the exact – I could tell you the exact amount of watch time that this channel has had on this YouTube channel ever. 
like up to the hour, you know, and it's like that's really what companies care about these days. Totally. I mean, and and you would too if you were in their position. Like, it's just like we were saying about the bike. Like, it's numbers based, and when they can make their decision off of that, I think that's been the tr- the struggle. Is like a lot of marketing for sports is is uh, based on qualitative, not quantitative. Mm. And if if you can give your money to Google Ads and see exactly how much you return you make on every dollar you put in Google Ads, then you're more likely to do that. Like it's a much more sure bet than give me the money, I'll spread the good word. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Know? Oh, it's so true, man. Like I, I think about it all the time, you know, like even with where I put my like attention and time. You know, like you just, the data is there and it's like I could interview this person. Like you have this three-hour patch where like you're with a person and that all gets turned into dollars at some point down the line, you know. And like you, when you've been in the game long enough, like you just know what is going to be profitable even down to like what shit you talk about. Like and it's kind of shitty yeah, <laughs> in a way, you know. Well, you just got to find a way to keep it true to you. Like we could sit here and and I could talk shit about the organizers of the race and make some good one-liners and you could put them on your Instagram channel and maybe people will watch the episode. But if you keep it true and just be honest and open and that's the best thing you can do. Well, and I think too, like just playing a long game. Like I think that's another underrated thing that people just, maybe people talk about it, but they just don't believe it. But it's like if you're, there's a, jiu-jitsu saying like the a black belt is a white belt that never quit yeah <laughs> it's literally that easy you know and just having like if you just play this long game and it's like, i think we're on our fifth or sixth year or whatever of doing the podcast and it's like it's doing good life's good but we'll probably be in 10 years so much further ahead and then you are going to be somewhere in four more years from now so it's like stay on the path, work hard, be smart, stay true to yourself. And in four years, like you were just the natural order of things, like you're going to have more of this and you will have more views here or whatever it is. But it's like, it's just not that difficult. It's yeah. just you stay on the process. Like you guys are in year two of frameworks or whatever year it is. And it's like, at some point, if you don't stop, you'll be at year 10. Yeah. <laughs> and you kind of just can't help but improve over that time if you do the right things. Totally. I'm, I'm a big believer in the long game. And it's just like I said, like at each decision along the way, you just handle it the best you can and learn from it. And that's the way you move forward. I have done a lot of things in the industry, I think have prepared me to be able to like, yeah, it's only the second year of frameworks, but I got so much support from the community for it in in the past i've started three bike parks that i've run myself yeah. started them off of elbow grease like so many people would come out because they'd see me out there like actually working on it i didn't just like sit at home and write a check like we actually went out there and made the best trails we could and then people came out to ride them and people saw the effort i was putting in there uh, me and my family run a race series the downhill southeast series in the southeast where we put on like five to seven races every year and they're honestly really awesome races and like we use all the income from the registration to just make the best race that we can and just doing that this is the ninth season of it and people see us out there and like most of those people are the ones that bought our frames so like it's a big circle and like within a small community like yeah we might not have been doing the frames for so long but people knew me as a person and i think like in some ways i've earned that respect for sure dude yeah no man a hundred percent and it's like uh there's a there's like a compounding effect that happens that just goes so far back that yeah like you're this guy now with this downhill frame that you've made but it is the result of almost like everything that you've ever done you know and you do I, th- I don't know whether people think about it in these terms as much, but like you're a brand. Every person in a sense is a brand and like some brands are more reputable than others. You're more likely to buy off something, off one brand over another, you know, and it's like you just spend years building like this personal brand and yeah, framework started the day that you first 
rode and tested for a team, you know? Yeah. And, and that's why it's important to be true to yourself and to just along the way, like that all amounts to, it, it all affects each other. Um, like I think a lot of times we'll try to give the best value we can at the bike park and get more people out there riding, open another day of the week, host events that maybe that event itself didn't make us more money, but we got a lot of people out there stoked on the day that they had. And that pays off with something else. More people then are going to be like, oh, I'm going to sign up for a race this year. Or more people are going to want to buy a frame or something. Like they, you, if you just do the best you can with all of the things going on, like it's maybe not going to quantify a direct payment here, but it'll, yeah. it'll, it all helps each other. Yeah. So what was the initial inspiration for a, a bike park? Uh, I wanted a place to train. Just, that's the, yeah. just the dream. Yeah. Was, and also it's fun. Like we said about Stu Baylor spending more time on the tractor than yeah. his dirt bike. Like it is really cool to create a trail. And it's interesting because there's like nothing stopping you. Like you can take a shovel today and go out there and do something. Yeah. And like you, just, you can just start doing it. And you can use the natural terrain. You can be creative. You can have a vision for a trail that you like and want to, oh, I really love this section in this trail I wrote. I want to try to make something like that with my own twist on it. So it's really fun to do trail building. Anybody who's done any probably can relate to that. And then I figured if I could make a place that I could train and had all the infrastructure in place and we can open it to the public, then it'll like it'll pay for it to be able to to have more trails and have more infrastructure there. So more people coming out to ride was just helping to make the place that I rode even better. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so what was the, I guess, like the initial effort that goes into something like that? Is it a pretty massive undertaking and like securing the land or what was the process like? So I've done three bike parks now. The first one was at Windrock in 2016. Is that the one that Gwyn owns? Now? Yeah, so yeah. it's it's absolutely crazy to think that. Isn't that The way cool, we though? started that bike park and now... Gwyn buying it is just unbelievable. Like at that time in 2016, I was teammates with Aaron and he lived in California in a mansion and would I could never get him to come out to ride in Tennessee. Like I always joked he would, he didn't want to get his shoes dirty. Yeah. <laughs> and now he's like out there working at Windrock, like take it, bought the bike park for hundreds of thousands of dollars and is like running it himself, which is just crazy. But in the beginning, me and my friend Sean Leader started the bike park. We had been riding there, shuttling ourselves. It's at an off-road park. So Windrock OHV is a place where you can go buy a Jeep pass, drive your Jeep, ride your Enduro moto, whatever you want to do. And there is a shuttle road that was paved because there's a bunch of windmills at the top. So the windmill company paved the road to be able to get up there and, and service their windmills. And you could shuttle that and ride some downhill trails that in the past guys had just bought a Jeep pass and uh, went and scratched a track in and they didn't like, they were happy with it. Like whenever we'd be out there riding the, the people that worked to the property were like, Hey, how can we get more bikers to come? I was like, well, there's not many people that were going to shuttle themselves, build their own track and, yeah. and then pay you to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, if you guys could provide that to them, then more people would want to come. And I, every time I went there, I talked to him more. And I was like, you know what? Like, I love doing this. Like I could probably help to implement it. And at that time, I was still like in the middle of my career. It was probably a big thing to bite off. And looking back, like not a good thing to do in the middle of a race career. Um, but yeah, we, the two of us, um, me and Sean, just went out there and improved all the trails that were scratched in. We bought two used school buses from a rafting company. So like people would put the rafts on the top and, yeah. and shuttle people down the river. And we, uh, we like cut the back door off so you could just go in with the bike and you'd like hold your bike in the bus. We took all the seats out <laughs> and we, we bought them for like three grand each. So it was like the cheapest way we could get people to the top. And we did it all ourselves. Like we were out there at night with an angle grinder, cutting the back door off the bus, cutting the seats out. And then during the day, we'd be out on the trail, like trying to make all the trails that were there just a little bit more sustainable and like yeah. beginner friendly and offer something to the public, like more than just one downhill track um so yeah we did that in about six or eight weeks like we built the whole bike park that we opened with in in the fall of 2016 and then with some contacts i had like we ended up being able to host a national race the next year it was like i said the series before you just hosted your round and then somebody else hosted the next yeah. round so we had the first round of the national series that year and became a place where um, a lot of riders would come in the wintertime to ride. Like I always did that myself. Like me and Luca would go out there and we'd shuttle laps in the winter. Um, 
but it was a place that only the locals would ride. Yeah. And after that, we had a bunch of te- like uh, SRAM and Fox did their winter preseason tests at Windrock, which I organized in 2018 and 19. So we had like the biggest brands, like almost all the ri- the guys who won the championship in the World Cup downhill and the EWS all came to Windrock to test that winter because we had built this training. Well, it wasn't really a training facility. It was just a downhill park yeah. focused on racing, like trails oriented towards downhill race or enduro race rather than free ride. And how would you describe the difference then? So it was just less like bike parky and it yeah. was more raw. I mean, we were basically just – trying to copy the tracks that we raced when we, whenever we built the trails. Like they were supposed to be rough. They weren't supposed to be smooth and maintained as well. Like it was basically going to practice on a racetrack, which was good for us, but not the best for business. Like there's not that many people that probably want to go to the gnarliest, roughest motor. Yeah, just like, get beat up. <laughs> I, I, yeah. When I ride my dirt bike, I want to go to a track that's fun to ride, yeah. you know, not one that's really, really, really hard. So, um, yeah, it was just – a different approach to how we built the bike park. Do you, when you think about the deviation that you've taken away from like your racing career, how do you think about it? Cause I mean, is it almost like you've just got more to offer the industry and more to offer your sport than just being a racer? I feel like I definitely do. Um, and I probably could have done better in racing. I don't know. I wouldn't change it for anything. Yeah, I, I feel like I'm super grateful to be in the position that I am. And even if I had been able to win a race or uh, got a few more podiums, that that would be for me. And all this stuff is, is a lot greater than that. So yeah. I'm I'm glad that I did it. But I, I yeah, I, I I just felt like I had the ability to do these things and had a tendency of maybe biting off more than I could chew. Like with a lot of these things, I like threw it on my plate. Like we're going to start this bike park. Yeah. And then once you're doing it, you like can't turn around yeah. because, you know, you said you were going to do it. People are coming out to your park to ride. I definitely learned a lot through the process, but it was stressful and prepared me for what I'm doing now. Yeah. And I, I think it's cool to have that perspective, you know, because like – Everyone wants to win and be like that guy, but it's like they can only be one of those guys at a time. And it's like the, you can offer so much more to the industry. Like if you think of it as like a net positive, like what's the net positive to mountain biking of you winning a World Cup? It's like not a lot. Like the, literally nothing changes, but the net positive of you three bike parks, organizing racing, a new frame company. It's like there's a – I hate the word legacy is kind of like lame, but it's like when you look back at your legacy, there's just so much more that is done for the good of mountain biking that is not winning a World Cup downhill race. Yeah, and and when I started doing that stuff, I, I could be really proud of it. And like after organizing one of our races that a bunch of guys came out and had a great time or people came to the bike park and enjoyed it, like – the feeling was similar to doing a good race. It was like, man, I'm really proud yeah. of what we did today. And and being proud of that is uh, is super gratifying. Um, yeah, man, I just think it's awesome. Like the, uh, because it takes a lot of, I feel like it takes a lot of internal bravery or like not, maybe not bravery, but like it's hard to follow your own compass. I feel like, especially. I, I like the quote, the difference between bravery and stupidity is the outcome. <laughs> That's actually so good, eh? It's true. Because if it doesn't work, you look stupid. And if it works, it's like, oh, my God, you're so brave, dude. But the idea that? was the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's so true. But I think, yeah, the, to follow your own compass, like you're doing good as a downhill racer and, you know, it's like everything that you do, the, there's an opportunity cost to everything in life and you just set yourself up with like this massive opportunity cost for the thing that is like was your career you know uh but to step outside of that and to follow your own belief and ideas like it takes more courage than what people think yeah absolutely and especially being on a pro race team like you saw a guy like i think that year when i opened the bike park i got sixth at the first race and seventh at the second race 
And if you saw a guy that was doing that in, in motocross, say he's going to start a business that cost him more time than riding, it probably wouldn't be received too well by the team or by people banking on his career. So um, it was tough, but it was something that I just loved to do. And I think the biggest thing was just finding the time for the recovery. Like I, yeah. I did the training and then I went and dug on the trails or I went and spent my time. Like a lot of guys will play Xbox or, or something. I was on linkage designing a frame. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and that stuff, like it takes energy, yeah. like even though it's mental energy. So um, I'd say I'm learning better to to manage the, the recovery time and, and giving yourself time to rest. But I definitely was just going full throttle and got pretty far doing it. So Yeah. <laughs> And so how long did it take for the bike park to be profitable to the point where you wanted to start a second and then a third? So it really was never so profitable at Windrock. Um, and Windrock's actually two and a half hours away from my house. So I would it was the only spot to ride in the southeast. So we'd always go there to ride. That's why we started it there. But it got to a point where it was not profitable and taking a lot of time. And at that point, I, I pretty much gave it to Sean for some – money that I hadn't already invested. I was like, hey, dude, here's a list of receipts that I have. Like, you have this truck there. You have this generator there. Like, if you just pay me back for that stuff, like, why don't you just take it and run with it? Because I don't have the time to, like, be coming out here and doing that. And, like, when I come, I want to come and ride yeah. and not, like, oh, this is broken. I need to fix it before I go ride. If you love something, let it go. <laughs> yeah. So I gave it away to him. And then at that time – um, a friend of mine, Dave Lamond, he uh, he owns a chain of doctor's offices, and he's really good with business, and he mountain bikes with us all the time. Like, you would never notice that. Like, he'd just be another guy out on the trail if you were out riding. And uh, he had the idea to start the bike park at Canuga, which is the second one we started. And at first, I just tried to give him as much advice as I could because he knew that I had done it already. And then he asked me if I, instead of paying me, could he, like, give me part ownership in it? So I helped out with that and like a lot of the layout for it. And this time it was, it was perfect because the first time we did it, we didn't have any money. Like it was me and Sean just doing it ourselves with yeah. hard work. And the second time it was like Dave could pay for everything we needed, but I knew how to not waste money <laughs> yeah. from the first time. So yeah. it was like, sweet, like we need this specific tool to do the job. We can get that, but we're not just going to blow the money because we did it with no money already. So it was a good balance. Like I learned the hard way and then knew yeah. how to do it efficiently. Yeah. And it was actually during, right when COVID hit, like it was spring of 2020, all the races got canceled and we had nothing to do. So I just went out to the bike park every day, built all the trails. I had laid them all out and we had guys lined up to help us build them while I was away racing. But when the races were canceled, I just helped build them all. And like the same guys were out working. I just normally showed up at like, 5 a.m., worked until like 8.30 when they got there, and then went about my day and then came back at 5 when they left and worked until dark. And like we just got so much more done because it was like able to do it and able to be there helping out. And that was a real pleasure. Like that time was really good. Like we had everything we needed to do a good job. We built an awesome bike park and like we had the time. It wasn't like I was like stressing because I should be training right now. It was like, well, all the races are canceled. We're probably not even going to race this year. So, yeah. And it's March. So like we ended up racing in October. So I had time and I like went there every day for three months and just worked on the park and really enjoyed that. And that one was actually much more profitable. It's not an uplift park. So you just buy a pass. It's kind of like Sky Park out here where you just buy a pass to access the trails. And, and you we, just do your own laps. Yeah. And we rent e-bikes there as well. And uh, it's much more beginner friendly like the first bike park was like the gnarliest racetrack It'd be like people going <laughs> to so like sick. ride a pay to ride a beat supercross track like yeah. there's not that many customers yeah. but then a uh, second bike park is like much more beginner and family friendly and fun forever like i have fun riding there it's pretty smooth and easy i go ride there and i feel like a million bucks and i go to yeah. windrock and i'm like Fuck, i suck at riding <laughs> so it's like just a different animal and that one just did so well. It was also the timing. Like during COVID, it was, yeah. we could open it. It was outdoor in the woods. Like if you want to come ride, come ride. We're open. Don't get too close to other people. If you don't feel safe, don't come. All yeah. good. We didn't get restricted like other businesses. So we did so well that first year. And then with that, we had the idea to open our, our second bike park that's a downhill park that's 20 minutes away. So these are both like within 30 minutes of my house. It's oh, way that's closer. So good. Um, and we had the resources to do a good job with these. So that's epic. 
Oh, I need to come check them out. That's where the first race of the Monster Energy what series is. What date is it, though? It's April. Um, yeah, I'm gone. 5th, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I'm leaving. I'm so pissed. Well, next year. I know, yeah. When, when's the last ones? It's the last ones in September. Yeah, so I'm here for, I'm here, I'm back here end of August. Okay, that's the US Open, which is the last race of the series and an established race already. So that's uh, the weekend before the World Cup at Mount St. Anne, and they're only like three hour drive apart. So you come to Killington, you could race yourself in the U.S. Open. That'd be sick. And then go to the World Cup final the next weekend. Just three hours. Um, I think we just made a plan. Perfect. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. So uh, before we finish off, plans for trail bikes, e-bikes, what else is going on in your mind with frameworks? I'd love to make like my version of the best bike in, in each category that I like riding. Um, I don't think e-bikes is something right away. Like there's a lot more moving pieces to that, then, then I'd really have the expertise to get into. We made an enduro bike that works awesome. Like I ride them probably more than downhill bikes, like pro downhill riders train Mostly, trail riding. Yeah. So you go trail ride, you do your cardio or whatever. Um, it's not every day you have somebody to shuttle you or, or you want to take the risk of riding downhill. So we ride these trail and enduro bikes a lot. And I made what I thought would be the best version of one um, without spending too much money on it. Like I knew there was a bunch of little things that were, I think it was a V1 prototype. And I gave it to Asa Vermette, who's um, riding on my team this year. He's gonna be the best rider in the world someday. He's like such a talented kid. Um, and he doesn't race enduro, but he was allowed to enter the pro category at national champs. Whereas in downhill, they told him he wasn't. Yeah, He had to race junior, but he could race pro enduro for some reason. So I was like, dude, why don't you try racing enduro? Like at least you could race against the big dogs. And I gave him the bike. He rode it um, one weekend at his house, and then he came out and he won the national champ ahead of Richie Rude, who won the Whoa. the World yeah. Series this year. <laughs> yeah, he was right ahead of him. So I was like, dude, the bike didn't hold him back. The bike's pretty darn good. I mean, more so, Asa's really good. We know that. <laughs> yeah. But um, our enduro bike rides awesome. Like I really love it. So that'll be the next step. Like this summer, we'll come out with a refined version of that, and hopefully offer them for sale the same way we did the DH bike. And there's just more people that are interested in those. Like for yeah. every, ask a big company, for every one downhill bike they sell, they sell 100 enduro bikes. Yeah. And ours is probably not the same ratio, but there's still a lot of people that wrote and were like, dude, I'd love to support, but I have no use for a downhill bike. Let me know when the enduros are ready. So we'll be doing that. And um, who knows, maybe a couple other categories of bike in the future too. That's so cool, man. And so, yeah, the boys that you have on your team are like legitimate world cup threats too oh yeah like asa i expect to be a threat for the win at every junior race all the junior races are televised now which is huge super cool huge value to us um so yeah over the, i expect him to be setting like jackson and jordan level times in junior and be a real threat and elite in two years as well and then angel suarez has had several podiums throughout his career he's finished top 10 in the overall a few times and he's so good like technically on the bike super talented he's definitely had a couple issues with his career he's done his shoulders a few times seems to be all healthy now um and he's bounced around through a few different teams over the past couple of years but i think he's learned what he needs to do his best and like we can provide that and have a good structure so it's like really cool with, for me to like work with those guys like i don't expect myself to be the guy going out there and winning the race anymore but i can take all the knowledge that i've accumulated over the 15 years I've been doing it and try to help those guys the best I can which is a really really fun process for me no it's awesome man well I've enjoyed this so much thanks so much for taking the time to to come and do it and I'm really excited to keep following the frameworks project but also the race team this year as well so yeah thanks a lot man we'll have to get you to ride the bike sometime dude I'd love that maybe I'll uh try and race it at the uh the u.s the, open the u.s open let's do it oh uh, that's sweet well thanks again man and uh i'll see you at san diego on the weekend yeah see you tomorrow appreciate it we're excited to announce the launch of our new membership site gypsytales.com packed with exclusive content and perks that you won't find anywhere else this is your chance to become a part of the gypsy gang and as a special bonus if you sign up to an annual membership you'll be entered into the draw to win our custom-built tc125 gypsy gang.